Good morning, everyone. Uh, my apologies for the slight delay uh, while we were setting up the platform. Um, so I welcome all the uh, distinguished participants who uh, who have registered for the event and uh, all of our esteemed uh, speakers uh, to this uh, seminar on uh, the advanced air mobility for healthcare emergencies. Uh, just to quickly introduce about myself, uh, my name is Hemant Sharma. And I am the program director for uh, Advanced Air Mobility Program at uh, AI and Robotics Technology Park, or <clears throat> Art Park in short. And uh, well, I have about 15, uh, 15 years of R&D experience uh, in the industry in the design, development, and uh, testing of fixed-wing UAVs as well as commercial aircrafts. Uh, the commercial aircrafts uh, was at my previous employment at uh, the Airbus Airbus Group in India. Uh, and I'm delighted to be hosting this seminar as a co-chair uh, along with uh, Dr. Omkar, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering uh, at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. So before we begin, I would uh, just like to share with you all that uh, uh, based on uh, the announcement of this seminar, uh, we have already received quite an enthusiastic uh, response from all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, and uh, mainly coming from the healthcare community, uh, also the student community. Uh, we also have uh, representation from the um, from the industry startups and also the government circles. And uh, we are expecting a participation of about roughly 300 participants uh, watching the event live. And uh, some of the participants in the seminar have also sent a few questions um, while uh, doing the reg registration itself and uh, during the individual sessions I will uh, also read out those questions and the speakers will try to answer them. So uh, without any further delay I would uh, like to now welcome Dr. Uh, Omkar to give a welcome note for the seminar and he will also briefly touch upon the agenda for the day. Uh, Dr. Omkar over to you please for the welcome note. Thank you, Hemant. Namaste to all of you. Very good morning. I will uh, share a small PPT um, to set the context. Uh, this is the seminar being organized by Art Park and IIC. And well, all these issues of response time for the air ambulance, uh, other benefits, I think we need to discuss all these things, that's why this seminar is being organized. And you know, earlier, the uh, drone whole delivery of essential goods, that's how it started pre-COVID, but uh, during and post-COVID, the scenario has completely changed and battling the 
spread of the virus was uh, in a very big way handled by the drones. So this is one of the context and you know that the air ambulance, a lot of um, uh, impetus on this all over the world and its uh, uh, numbers are increasing, not only in terms of the number of air ambulances, but also in terms of the business prospectives. And well, there are a lot of issues to be discussed. That's why we have organized this, the medical legal issues associated with this, pilot, whether there should there be a pilot or should it be completely um, you know, uninhabited or unmanned, unpiloted aerial vehicle? Should we have a doctor on board or paramedic or a robo-assisted things could work? Then what about the psychological perspectives from the patient point of view? Then in the Indian context, are there any specific challenges to be addressed? Towards this, we have another than the uh, legendary uh, Devi Prasad Shetty uh, to look at uh, these issues of um, why does India need an advanced technology infrastructure to address healthcare emergencies, a case for drones and advanced air mobility. Uh, we will come to this a little later. Followed by this, we will have a panel discussion to sort out some of the issues. What are some of the challenges of using air ambulance and what are the medical legal issues, etc. We have Dr. Satish Rudrapa, Dr. Sai Shankar, Dr. Rahul Singh, Dr. G.V. Ramana Rao, and I will moderate that session. Dr. Satish Rudrapa is a leading neurosurgeon uh, at the Sakra Hospital. He heads the Department of Spine and Surgery. At, uh, he is also the director of the Institute of Neurosciences at the Sakra Hospital. He has a lot of uh, awards. <coughs> it is very difficult to capture all their expertise and honors in a very brief slide like this. Then we have Dr. Sai Shankar, who is not just a pediatrician, but a pediatrician with the distinction of handling very, very complicated issues associated with uh, uh, pediatrics. He is, will be with us. He also has uh, you know, direct uh, interaction in handling the issues of air ambulances. Then we have, you know, what we call as the directive from Harshmouth, Dr. Rahul Singh Sardar. Uh, you know, this ACAT is uh, uh, in a, a leading organization in our country, which is providing the ambulance services. Uh, services. And uh, Dr. Rahul is the flying doctor. That's uh, as it's called, and he will also share his expertise and uh, guide us as to what we should look forward to. Then we have Dr. G.V. Ramana Rao, and uh, well, he is uh, the Director of Emergency Medicine Learning Center and Research, and uh, he will, um, in the, these are the people who are working in the forefront of these emergency services, and in fact, we at the Art Park had the fortune of interacting with uh, both Dr. Satish Rudrappa and Dr. Ramana Rao uh, prior to all this, uh, uh, this seminar and prior to formulating uh, the requirements for air ambulance. Then we will have some of the sessions requirements of the flying ICU from the ICAT. Again, we will have two flying doctors. Uh, one, of course, Dr. Rahul Singh Sardar, another Dr. Shalini Nalwad. Then uh, this uh, we have seen Dr. Uh, Sardar's um, uh, accomplishments. Uh, Shalini is also a flying doctor. She uh, uh, also holds uh, the fellowship of, in anesthesia from College of Anesthetics, Ireland. She has worked on hand with several of these ambulance related issues. We will know more about those things during the panel discussion. Then we will have a session on airworthiness certification requirements by Mr. Chetan Noyek. He is a lead engineer with the Airbus Group. And uh, he's also an alumni of uh, uh, IAC, our own department. So it's uh, good to have him. And he will also tell us because certification is one of the very, very painful things. And more we understand, the better will be our design. Then we will have uh, about the, you know, how do you handle this? Uh, traffic management of the VAVs, how do you manage the airspace? And for this, we have Professor Debashish Ghosh. I'm proud to be a colleague of him at the Department of Aerospace Engineering. 
He is a very, very leading personality in the country on the areas of uh, uh, guidance and control. And he has participated in uh, most of the leading projects in the country with regard to guidance and navigation. Then uh, we have Mr. Hans. Uh, look at the you know other uh, infrastructure that is needed for a major program like this, the vertiports, etc. And to that, we have uh, from the independent business group a person who is actually has a very practical experience in these kind of uh, strategies, and he will also tell us as to how we should configure this for a good business perspective also. Then design and manufacturing of air ambulance. And whenever we talk anything flying up in the air with a rotor in the country, we have no one else except to Professor Abhishek from IIT Kanpur to reckon with. Professor Abhishek is an associate professor and Abdul Kalam Technology Innovation Fellow at the Department of Aerospace at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He has vast experience in all these uh, uh, vehicles, that is the autonomous vehicles. So he will tell us about some of the design challenges. Then the closing uh, keynote will be delivered by Mr. Umakan Soni, who is the CEO of this art park. So now, well, it is time for us to look at this. Why does India need this kind of a technology? What are the issues that are involved? Is it feasible, possible? What is the way to look forward? And for this, we have none other than Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, who is a legendary figure in the country. He is the founder of the Narayana Health Foundation, he is chairman and a senior consultant and a cardiac surgeon. And uh, well, his uh, uh, resume to write, I think we need at least about 500 pages of a book uh, and to capture in a couple of slides is next to impossible, but we all have heard of him. And he is also, uh, he was the personal physician of Saint Mother Teresa. Not only that, for many leading who is who, I think uh, uh, they all consult Devi Shakti, but the distinction is that he not only works at ease with celebrities, but he has also touched several poor of the poorest in the country. In fact, one of the things which I should not miss is his concept on the micro health insurance. That's what today we see as the Yashaswini program, which is so successful and has established a huge network of hospitals across the country. And he has also worked a lot in the field of the telemedicine and to list the awards, I think it is phenomenal. He is the recipient of the Padma Bhushana, to name a few, then Dr. B.C. Roy Award, which is very, very uh, now distinct award given by the Medical Council of India. Then he has also been bestowed with the Rajyotsava Award. I think we have the Devi Shakti here who can guide us through what is the way to look forward and what are the specific challenges in our country, India, and how to handle this. Over to you, sir. We are honored to have you on board. Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm extremely grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, future is never an extension of the past. It is different. And COVID has opened everyone's eyes and it has disrupted every aspect of human life and the existence. The maximum impact of COVID we are going to see in the way healthcare will be delivered in the future. Global healthcare and wellness industry. Today, I would like to just talk about how technology is going to disrupt this industry. Uh, may not be only about the air mobility. Uh, global healthcare and wellness industry is over $8.6 trillion industry. Sadly, after spending $8.6 trillion, less than 20% of the world's population has access to uh, uh, high-tech secondary and tertiary level healthcare. And it is not going to change until the healthcare industry embraces digital technology. And this is the only hope 
for 80% of the world's population. Today, sitting here, we can dream of any technological, innovative products available to citizens of our country. Anything is possible, but there is only one roadblock. Do we have the money to have it? So as far as I'm concerned, if a solution is not affordable, it is not a solution. So I strongly believe that digitization is the only future because digitization will make healthcare safer for the patients. Today, healthcare is not very safe for the patients. Even in country like United States, medical error is one of the uh, largest causes of death. And digitization, taking away the pen and paper from the hands of doctors, nurses, and technicians can bring down the uh, medical error significantly. And digitization will make healthcare accessible and affordable. Uh, imagine a situation where, where every patient past the age of 60, he walks into our office, they have a, this thick file with all the medical records. It is impossible for any doctor to decipher it in 10 minutes they have. Imagine all the data is stored in the patient's mobile phone with a barcode uh, reader or a scanner. And if the patient comes to my secretary and submits the uh, EMR to my file and in no time I can go through everything. And that experience is possible in every industry today in our country other than healthcare industry. The, uh, we believe that irrespective of what patient has within the next two to three years time, starting from headache to heart attack to cancer, first time consultation will happen online. Patients are going to see the doctors in their own drawing room, from their own drawing room, sitting on the couch with the mobile phone in the hand and they will be able to consult any of the specialist or a super specialist doctor. And this is going to happen whether as senior doctors, whether we like it or not. This is the reality and we should be prepared. And there will be, when this kind of a transformation happens, healthcare outcome will be outstanding because most of the diseases will be diagnosed at a very, very early stage. And most of the chronic diseases like diabetes will be uh, treated much better because every time the blood sugar goes up and down, if the patient has to see the doctors, he, has to, he will lose one day of work and the wages and the inconvenience. So they just continue to manage themselves with a high sugar or a low sugar. Now, if there is a way they can communicate to the doctors with the simple communication tools like messages or a WhatsApp, and give them the message. Within two hours, they can get the reply from the doctor and his team as what should be the next dose of insulin. And this can be done without much effort, much cost. And I strongly feel that within the next two to three years time, uh, smart software in the outpatient will make smarter diagnosis than the doctors. And within the next maybe five years, seven years time, it will become legally mandatory for the doctors to get the second opinion from the software before starting the treatment. This is the reality, whether we accept it or not. Now, all these changes, we feel it will always take 10 years and 20 years. It is not going to take that long. In state of Uttarakhand, five years ago, the Chief Justice of Uttarakhand passed a judgment that in the state of Uttarakhand, no doctor can prescribe the medicines on a paper. It has to be on a digital uh, tool. Unfortunately, the, the infrastructure was not ready, but the court has moved ahead of the doctors and the infrastructure. And this is the reality and this is going to happen. And when all this transformation happens, hospitals of the future, I'm not talking about the distant future. I'm talking about the future, which is another three years or five years time. When you enter the hospital reception, there will, not be, there will be a reception without receptionist because there is no need for receptionist. Everything what a receptionist does 
would have been done previous day or two days earlier by his patient sitting in his house, receptionist working from home, entire registration process, entire payment, everything will be done before the patient arrives at the hospital. All the patient will have in the mobile phone, the timing of the consultation, name of the doctor and the room number. That's all. And that will allow the patient to go to the doctor. And when he sits in front of the doctor, the usual question doctors ask is, uh, how, what is your problem? But that will change. Doctor has the entire history of the patient. And doctor is going to narrate the patient history to the patient, waiting for some additions or some changes. And the whole experience will be different. And the patient will be so happy that first time he is meeting a doctor who knows everything about him. So there is a huge trust factor which will be built in the whole process. Then when the patient is in the ICU, you visit the ICU, intensive care. Intensive care unit will not have intensivist. Intensivist will be working from home because across the world, best care in ICU happens only between 9 to 5 p.m. 16 hours in a day, patient gets suboptimal care. That 16 hours in, a, in the 24 hour cycle, if you split into four hours and let the intensive stay at home, he can see the patient in a, uh, in a laptop or a desktop sitting in his house. He can talk to the doctors, he can talk to the nurses, he can talk to the patient. And that all those technologies are available, which we are piloting. I'm not talking about the technology of the future. This has happened in every industry and it has to happen in our industry. And COVID has taught us that in a hospital, there should be only people who are going to touch the patient should be working there. People who are not going to touch the patient, they don't need to be there. How, why should we expose hundreds of these young girls and boys carrying one blood sample from one bed to the uh, blood gas machine. A cheap robot, which is designed to carry all those samples, can be doing this job. So essentially, most of the transportation uh, uh, activity inside the hospital will be done by very, very inexpensive robot. And let's now look at uh, what can happen if you have a freedom of creating various vehicles for air mobility. If Garden City of Bangalore, which eventually became a tech city, if it becomes a drone city, which has the permission to fly drones across the city of Bangalore, do we need that many blood banks? We don't need, we need few blood banks and all the hospitals can be linked to the blood bank. Then look at the efficiency. Do we need that many laboratories to do blood tests? We can centralize most of the blood. There can be collection centers in multiple places. If it's a matter of, there are already pilots conducted by Amazon and various pizza companies in shifting all these pizzas and various things we people buy online. So it is a matter of time. All these things, what I'm talking about will become a reality. In Africa, there are very few blood banks. Entire blood supply of Africa, most of the countries, are done through the drones. So essentially, uh, imagine a situation, if we have the freedom of flying drones everywhere, somebody uh, develops a cardiac arrest and there is no defibrillator. You can fly the defibrillator from one destination to the other with your mobile phone. So essentially, Many, many things can happen. Now, coming back to the uh, air ambulance. Air ambulance is a necessity tool for every country. Now, in our country, unfortunately, cost of air ambulance is 10 times more than the cost of the treatment. And that is the reason why air ambulance hasn't picked up in spite of all the efforts. We have to change the way people uh, echo, they get the services of air ambulance. If the patient has to pay for every air evacuation, it is not going to be affordable for most of the Indians, most of the Indians. Now, imagine if we collect maybe 50 paisa from the toll booth 
toll collection in the uh, uh, on the highways if you collect just 50 paisa from every time you cross the toll booth but in the process any time there is a road traffic accident the the air ambulance will pick you up in less than 10 minutes because most people who die following road traffic accident they die do not be, they don't die because of the injury they sustained they die because of the blood loss during the entire duration of transport from the site of accident to the site of care. And with the air ambulance, which can be easily, uh, which can land on a highway or a next door to the next to the highway, we can address this. So essentially, all these services to become popular, we need to uh, allow create a vehicle for people to contribute indirectly rather than directly. We obtain many, many services, like as I was explaining about the air ambulance, and if the air ambulance gets makes, uh, has a viable business model from the money collected from the toll booth, then other air evacuation becomes affordable because the maintenance cost of the air ambulance will be paid by the money collected from the toll booth then they have to just pay for the fuel and the maintenance cost. That's all. There is no infrastructure cost. So essentially, all these changes will happen. And it will happen much, much faster in our country. I'll give you an example. Today, if you have to buy a health insurance, the premium is formidable for most of the Indians. But I'm sure you're reading in all the social media and various uh, gadgets, the, the, uh, the tools we read and uh, we uh, digest the news in uh, online. There are advertisements coming for health insurance to cover one lakh rupees, one lakh rupees of health insurance with a premium of 999 rupees and no questions asked. Now, smart people like us will say that, oh, this is the unviable business uh, uh, proposition. They are going to close. But believe me, they will not close. They shouldn't close. If we want to see a different future, they shouldn't close. We have to support them because these are the kids who are not scared of taking risk. They want to change the world. They may not know how to change the world, but they will make mistakes and they will learn. And in the process, they are in the end, they are going to teach us the lesson because everything which transformed the world always starts as an unrealistic and unviable proposition. But in the end, if the objective is honorable, they will always succeed. And this is what we need to do in our attempt to make air mobility accessible and affordable to everyone. There is no point in having these services affordable to the people who can afford to pay uh, lakhs of rupees. It has to be affordable to the common man of the country. How all this happened? Today, every aspect of entertainment, what a rich man has access to, even a poor man has just by paying 100 or 200 rupees per month in his mobile phone. All these things have happened because of the, uh, uh, I would say, audacity or the uh, ignorance of the young people that certain things cannot be done. And our job should be to encourage them. Once again, I'm extremely grateful to you, for all of you, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much. And I would like to wish all the best for all your endeavors to make air mobility affordable and accessory, uh, uh, affordable and accessible service for every Indian. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty. I think uh, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, listeners, I think you have welcomed them all by giving them a lot of courage into the future. Thank you so much. I take this opportunity to profoundly thank you for the wonderful services you have done to the society, to the government in guiding even the public, especially from the past two years of COVID trauma. Thank you so much. Just I have one small question to you because we have been talking about organ transport using these drones. And especially there are some uh, questions asked about the most popular thing is the transporting the, the, for the heart, for the heart transplant. Yes. What is your take on this? 
Yes, uh, just now we are doing a heart transplant in my hospital. It is going on. And we shifted the uh, heart from uh, other part of the city. And Bangalore police is very helpful for us to shift. But with all the effort, it takes, you're talking about minimum an hour of time before the heart comes out of one, the donor's body uh, and it gets inside the recipient's body. If we have the option of shifting the samples by a drone, the entire thing can be reduced to less than half an hour. And half an hour of time in heart and lung transplant, in lot of the vital organ, can make a huge difference in the outcome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, when we had the Indo-US workshop, one of the devil advocate remark on this was that for the heart transplant, uh, apparently you prepare the patient the moment you know the it is going to arrive. But the question asked was that if drone crashes in between, uh, what are the medical legal issues? I know your time is at premium, I know, but uh, I was tempted to ask this question. Sure. No, the, the, I, I agree. I mean, only when we are sure about the, uh, uh, the, the certainty of the, uh, the, the drone's uh, reliability and a backup mechanism. It's not difficult to create a backup mechanism in a city like Bangalore. When we know the track where it is going to fly, it's not going to change the route every uh, other day. When we know the uh, flight track, it is possible to uh, uh, keep standby system in case of uh, some uh, unforeseen accident. Because it can be encased in a manner that even if it falls, heart won't get damaged. It's stored in a, a liquid uh, box. So that is not a problem. And we can always pick it up and continue with our journey. I don't think it's a big problem in a city like that. I think, yeah. I think you have given us a lot of uh, uh, impetus to uh, carry on with this uh, uh, work because this is something worldwide people are looking at. I'm sure it's going to become a reality. I think with the guidance of uh, experts like you, I think uh, uh, I know you have uh, some pending surgery. I know that. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Devi Prasad. And we look forward to continued interaction with Art Park. I think we will come back to you for your suggestions as to how to implement this air ambulance concept from perception to a product level. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hemant, do you have anything? Uh, you know, I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Devi uh, for uh, giving an eye-opening session on uh, the technology in general, uh, how it can impact healthcare. And um, very soon we are going to witness the um, the transformation uh, of this technology from the aerial delivery uh, perspective. So uh, yes, I think uh, that was a wonderful session, uh, Dr. Devi. And uh, um, I think since you uh, have a limited time for the session, uh, we we can uh, we can stop your session for now. And uh, yeah, please accept. Uh, uh, our sincere uh, gratitude for attend taking out your time and attending the session. Thank you. Thank so we all express our uh, thanks to Professor Dev Prashetti by the virtual clapping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> well, audience, I think uh, again I welcome you all. I think uh, this was a wonderful session from. Uh, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, he has shown how we should, the way we should look at the healthcare perspective, what kind of vision we should have. I think Art Park fully resonates with this kind of vision. So what is this air ambulance? What uh, people have been talking about, what is this advanced air mobility? What kind of uh, concepts the Art Park has formed? Because this Art Park has taken up this as a moonshot program and uh, quite intense effort has gone into this because perception, how do you perceive the concepts? That is going to be the key thing. Product will come eventually. So what is this air ambulance? So we have a video for you to know what we are talking about. Can we have the video clip from the art park? Over to the art park studio. Do you 
you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108, an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area. Any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. A very big thanks to the studio at the Art Park. I'm sure our um, viewers could get a glimpse of uh, what the Art Park is uh, talking about, what is the vision of the Art Park. And now let us go through a small PPT about uh, this, uh, in general, the drones in the healthcare. And uh, I'll take uh, about 10 minutes uh, yeah, so drones, uh, you know, that uh, it is uh, now has come to play a ubiquitous role. You take any sector, drones are there. Uh, it Although it started basically as a hobby 
kind of thing uh, maybe more than a decade ago then gradually it developed and people saw some business prospects in terms of uh, uh, delivering some pizzas etc but uh, suddenly yes the covid became a big turning point uh, looking at drones in a totally different way what and how it can do a social impact and uh, drones which was you know, previously pre covid was seen as a you know utility vehicle only that will help only the house and have not have nothing to do with this but now the scenario has changed uh, the spectrum of the uh, application of drones has completely changed with the concept of drones in health care especially emergency medicine supplies medical services and now the talk about the air ambulance the scenario has completely changed nonetheless there are several challenges in this why we should look at the drone ambulance or medical service uh, drone is one is the response time because we all been hearing from the doctors that response time is the crucial thing we also heard dr devi prasad shetty mentioning that in road accidents it is the uh, you know the loss of blood that could really cost the life that happens because of this uh, delay in the time then people talk about as yes, drones and ambulance will it not become costly calculations of cost effective ratio i'll show you the example show that it is not so in fact they can be cheaper than the road ambulances not only that they are highly convenient to use because today we are seeing in a city like uh, even bangalore you, you know ambulance movement is not that easy many times we have seen that the patients in the ambulance are struck um, knowing not what to do because simply the ambulance cannot move and we have seen that police also become helpless because of the traffic jam which is so intense that it can be very frustrating experience so what is the way out way out is only how we can move through the air then we have to look at the medical drone market yes because unless there is a market there is a business uh, model uh, not many will venture into this because all cannot run like a, you know uh, a social um, activity it has to have a business perspective then emergency situation and operations where all drones really make uh, sense what are the current challenges issues then the future of air ambulance industry the future is quite bright already there are air ambulances no doubt it's not a new concept for example helicopters but they have their own limitations and problems that's why we have been looking at how we can uh, use the current technology to create air ambulances which are uh, without a trained pilot and how robots can assist and take the role of at least a paramedic to support many of the uh, needs of the patient well now drones can get uh, a, you know especially for uh, in case of heart attacks a defibrillator if you take you know patients within 4 to 6 square mile radius can be reached in a minute which is 10 times faster than the conventional emergency services so this is something this can save life of many because we have seen at least in our country the death due to uh, heart attack and especially they not getting that uh, treatment at the right time could cost the life then increasing chance of survival from 8 to 80 percentage in developing countries such as india there is shortage of safe uh, blood in hard to reach areas the delay can be really very very costly so uh, if you can take the blood samples which is quite uh, with the technology available uh, right now it has been easy and i am happy that uh, to say that lot of drone companies have already tried this and this could be of great help where 
you know, increasing uh, the survival from 80 to 80 percent is something very, very big. Then both in uh, urban and suburban areas, you can see the limitations associated with uh, satellite images when you have cloud contamination, etc. And these can be overcome by the drones, which can provide you uh, all topology of the uh, area very quickly. Then within a zone of about 12 kilometers, uh, the people have done some simulation models which show that drones could increase vaccine availability and uh, decrease in the cost. Not only that, especially when it comes to the anti-venom, you know, in snake bites, uh, for your information, snake bite uh, deaths, even now in our country is a serious issue. And non-availability of anti-venom injections is a real issue. And uh, there are companies who have already ventured. So this is a good opportunity. If you can create a proper infrastructure, both in terms of uh, the traffic management and how to reach. And so that could really greatly help. So this is what people talk, say, the, okay, the cost who is going to bear, but you should look at what is known as the cost effective ratio. This is very, very important because cost effective ratio is defined as cost of new strategy minus cost of the current practice. Here, new strategy, we mean drones. Current practice, we mean the road ambulance. Then the effect of new strategy minus effect of current practice. So this cost effective ratio is in uh, rupees per minute. So if you look at the effect, we mean that in how many minutes can you reach? And uh, uh, so that because in medical emergencies, time is very, very critical. We know that life is more critical than the cost. Everything cannot be measured by the economy. But yet, what we want to tell is that even there, usage of drones is very, very useful. For example, you can see in this uh, one of the examples where the cost of the new strategy uh, is for drone transportation. It is about 1,313 rupees per minute. This service 1,266 rupees per minute of the you know, regular road ambulance. Calculation so that you get a ratio as minus almost approximately three. Minus means that you are saving the cost. So the cost effectiveness ratio shows that usage of drones is not penalizing our pockets. So that is the uh, idea. And also we saw that uh, uh, Professor Shetty giving some of the you know other alternates to set up the infrastructure by raising some money in terms of the you know collecting some tolls or some such things so that it will help the many. So there are people already in the market. I have shown uh, a few of uh, the what is available. One of course we have heard of the zipline, which is very very uh, you know in the very much in the news, then TU Delt also has done. There are a lot of people uh, elsewhere in the uh, world already into this uh, medical drone market. And uh, organ transport is one of the main things that people have been looking at. Um, there a lot of things are involved. Uh, there are a lot of challenges and how to overcome. I think the engineers and doctors are working in tandem. Uh, that is, this is one of the, you know, uh, very critical technology where the convergence between the engineers and doctors, uh, scientists is of uh, immense importance. So here we see some more where they have actually used for delivery of medicines and other essential supplies. Uh, both uh, fixed wing and remote people have been working and there are a lot of other uh, hybrid architectures which even Art Park, one of the aim is to develop some of the VTOL configurations, which will overcome the limitation of things like um, uh, runway, etc., which can also be faster, which can uh, take off and land from any uh, constrained uh, set settings. So this is something that is going on. So you see some more examples um, where the Rwanda government 
delivering blood using drones to clinics where reach is difficult then uh, the madagascar drone successfully transport blood samples there is empty number of examples and even in our country india i know several companies uh, which uh, are involved they have already done some trials in uh, proving this so these are some more examples especially to carry the blood samples and things like anti venom and the vaccines for the covid in particular uh, there are a lot of uh, things that have gone through and you know that uh, the, although the drones started with um, the essential supply of goods and services uh, pre covid that's how we wanted to deliver pizza or some other items and it looked as though that okay this is drones are uh, meant only for uh, people who have uh, money to spare and they don't do much it's only for some industries etc then the covid actually changed the whole perspective it's a although it did lot of damage it is actually a game changer in terms of the technology so to say so medical care became the prime most uh, important thing where drones immediately came you know the uh, the as soon as the outbreak happened drones actually converted themselves into what you call as the socially helpful element all of a sudden and vaccine delivery became very very common and it was also used to create situational awareness around they wanted to for example warn people they used mics on the drones for various announcements etc and uh, this really changed and now that has that momentum has continued into the other dimensions of uh, medicine delivery so current challenges says we have been talking about reliability of the flight how reliable is it because you are carrying something vital and so you know crash etc uh, is almost unpardonable but yet we all know that anything that is uh, a mechanical machine there cannot be anything called reliability equal to 1 it cannot be there so we have to see how to make it reliable and how to make it safe for example as uh, dr shetty remarked as create such enclosures which are impact proof and do a uh, you know parachute uh, protection etc i think uh, as engineers we are aware and we have been looking at all these things the weight weight parameters the flight time range these are all the issues the batteries etc i think we have been uh, as engineers we have been uh, looking at it and um, then the regulatory frameworks yes uh, that is also been going on how to standardize how to regulate with the dgca we have been working and um, i am also involved as the chairperson of the drone standardization committee in india i think those things will fall into place uh, soon so these are some of the things that we have been looking at so air ambulance yes the need is uh, growing the projection is even from the business perspective is quite promising uh, even emergency medical services and drone services i think even for the entrepreneurs because today uh, i hear that uh, nearly 420 startups have come up in the drones in the country i think uh, all of them have a big share big role to play in this uh, ems or emergency medical service and drones and here are some of the current air ambulances in uh, india i think i'm running short of time and currently the cost roughly you know what we figured out from our uh, google is that it's about 2.5 lakh to 18 lakhs it cost depending upon the distance it's quite expensive even today there's no doubt but i think with the uh, increase in the usage and with the change in the technology i think the cost will come down and become affordable and today yes we have two excellent speakers from acat i think they are doing a wonderful service already inside the country i think we have them on board of uh, today's uh, seminar 
so i think they will shed more light into the way forward with this air ambulance if there are issues how to handle this rural areas uh, then single patient transportation um, evacuation how to move how to put them onto the bed how to strap them can it be somewhat robotized or do we need some uh, skilled people or um, then especially when you want to supply vaccines or anti venom things which have short shelf life how to manage this time and the traffic um, then the how to help the home bound patients um, then emergency medicine service then the of course one has to look at the economics of the whole game well we all know just this graph shows that okay the urbanization things will keep increasing and the ambulance delays will keep increasing there is no doubt about this so not only that uh, the air ambulance uh, is uh, an option but it may become compulsory in the days to come the way the urbanization is going on it may become a a very compulsory thing and i think it's uh, at the right time art park has been looking at these things in much advance so that we will not uh, um, allow the society to suffer because of non availability of a technical facility so i'm sure this is going to come up well there are issues medico legal issues are there and what about the patient psychology if you want to put the patient alone on a uh um may drone and send him somewhere what will happen and if you want to have a pilot or no pilot um, because if it is pilot uh, etc then already helicopters are there so what is the big advantage of this so there are a lot of argument that are going on and i am sure uh, the our engineers in the country are uh, quite capable of overcoming all these problems and uh, we have very capable doctors Uh, who can help us to uh, convert or to a very optimal air ambulance for the future i think it holds a tremendous uh, future um, there are a lot of technical technological challenges both for engineers and doctors and i am glad at this stage that iac has taken a big initiative in um, creating a hospital facility also which uh, where i think uh, science engineering medicine they are all converging and at this juncture of time art park is coming out with this air ambulance concept is most welcome and i thank you all for your patient uh, listening i think now we are uh, uh, time for the um, the very interesting uh, discussion the panel discussion on how to take it forward we have real real experts here i will just uh, um emant i will walk through the uh, slides again uh yes uh, dr omkar you can uh, you can first introduce all the panelists yeah I'll do that um and uh, so we will have a very interesting uh, panel discussion uh, and we have dr satish rudrappa who is the director of the neuroscience department uh, at the sakra hospital in fact we had uh, uh, interacted with dr satish rudrappa in fact he, he was uh, when we conceived this uh, project we first invited him to give us some insight into the aspects of this trauma air ambulance how we should uh, conceptualize the whole project yeah, he was very kind to really come and guide us through uh, what are these medical requirements so uh, dr rudrappa we welcome you and thank you for your um, uh, advice and guidance and today also we look forward to the proceedings on this and thank you <laughs> he has several laurels to his credit <clears throat> uh, and, and he is also yes uh, 
you know very socially active helping number of people in making the um, medical advice and technology affordable and then we have sai shankar again from uh, the sakra hospital he specializes in pediatric uh, uh, department he, he has uh, a global experience uh, in leading children hospital he has been working at uk australia also and he has this unique distinction of uh, you know working with the uh, especially in the in helping the uh, premature uh, born children uh, even uh, with the help of air ambulance so we will look forward to welcome dr sai shankar thanks for joining and uh, we have uh, the people who are actually in this uh, segment already in this country dr rahul sik sardar who has a great vision and ambition to make the uh, uh, the availability of this uh, air ambulances affordable to uh, every citizen of this country whoever is needy uh, dr rahul singh welcome you for the panel discussion then dr gv ramana ra another leading name in emergency medicine services in fact uh, we were very happy that he actually interacted with us we invited him for interaction uh, some maybe one or two months back to give us more insight into the this project of air ambulance because in all these things uh, you know conceiving the uh, concepts that perception is very important to take it to a product so we welcome you dr gv ramana rao look forward to the deliberations so yes we will uh, now begin with uh, the panel discussion uh, we have all the panelists on board so let me uh, start with the uh, um, basic uh, what you call as uh, the layman's question what would anybody uh, you know, who does not who is not aware of the seriousness of the requirements one of the comments they make is why all this for a country or like india why do you talk about air ambulance why are you investing in all these things uh, what is your take first let me begin with dr satish yeah exactly you no know, thank you uh, dr onkar for uh, this fantastic program i think you know uh, this is a relevant question which you asked uh, yes uh, we always used to think india is a developed a developing country and you know we may not need to so many other things which are require uh, priority over these kind of thing but i differ with that because india is a country which has a population uh, which is a younger population if you look at uh, the whole population of india it is nearly about uh, now 28 to 37 person is in the age group of 25 to 30 years so and this is a productive uh, the uh, age and these are the this is a population is the one which will take our country to the next level which we have for last 75 years what we achieved you know we had to achieve the higher level and when you have the younger population the mobility is the key for them to achieve and to contribute back to the you know country so mobility in their you know education they go and mobility in their job seeking way they move from place to place they communicate not only on the web but they communicate in personally so what we found in the recent uh, trend is the increase in the highway accident especially the high speed accident low no high velocity accident in fact when i was a student roads were not good in india and most of them were low impact uh, accidents but now in the highway we find high impact accidents with increased in the newer technology newer cars speed and you know, everybody every youngster wants zero to you know 100 km how fast the car moves you know that they will be looking before buying so when you have this kind of advancement which is happening in india with population as well as the the uh, new roads new technology new vehicle coming with a newer generation thinking they are equal in the rest of the world i think we are going to bound to happen two things one 
increase in the accidents and how quick we take care of these you know impacted uh, in the individuals on the spot that is one so because 90% of the air related problems are usually you know in <coughs> any part of the world is related to road traffic accidents the second one is the the need you know where the india is medically very well advanced except for the basic research and i am a very proud indian doctor and i know how the indian system works as of now the technology which is there in the rest of the world is is there in every good hospitals in our country so when we have such a technology the newer things like transplant related things uh, and newer chemotherapies newer the cancer being the fourth uh, uh, disease which is going to have the mortality and which will not differentiate age and gender there's a newer technology which is required for this i think transplant you know is one of the keys where you Sorry, require i will come to that later because i have some questions on that okay okay but i think so, Eric, you, you it is very out, essential i don't uh, think uh, you know yes 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 i think your point you brought a very interesting point about this high impact accidents yeah Correct. i think that's a good thing now i'll rotate this question to dr rahul singh sardar uh, you know on the comments why country like india should look at this um, this kind of what right now in courts people would call it as fancy stuff thank you all for uh, you know uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me on this uh, panel and uh, yeah i would like to go by uh, sheer uh, facts and numbers uh, we are a very large population 130 million uh, you know one of the largest uh, you know the second largest in the world the highest number of road traffic related deaths uh, in the world that is 152000 people die on indian roads every year that is one death every 3 minutes 400 and uh, 400 people dying every day that is one jumbo jet full of people crashing it is literally you know the statistics are very you know obvious in front of, in front of us the sheer gdp loss in terms of the 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 young lives lost on the indian roads is enormous and the the, the uh, our medical services are very centralized um, uh, the you know the the state of art and the tertiary centers are all centralized services uh, in the periphery in the in the tier 2 or tier 3 uh, centers uh, uh, the the facilities are not geared up enough to manage a very uh, advanced level of uh, criticality of uh, patients uh, and uh, especially if you are talking about road traffic deaths and why an air ambulance is not only a, you know a necessity but an obligation from you know uh, from the state towards its population is the very simple fact you know we uh, represent india in the g20 all the 19 countries of the g20 have air ambulance services state uh, supported air ambulance services we are the only one in the whole of g20 who do not have an air ambulance service we don't we don't have a structured training program for the doctors and the paramedics uh, you know who needs to be in these aircraft we don't have the aviation infrastructure we don't have enough planes we don't have uh, a financial model to make it self sustainable we don't you know uh, you know all these uh, 19 countries of g20 uh, the hem services the helicopter emergency medical services supported by the state and the the victims don't pay anything i mean it is impossible to uh, um, you know uh, uh, confirm uh, a payment model for this in, in an emergency we need to mobilize a helicopter which i will you know disclose in, in my talk later but uh, yeah so uh, the, the 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 facts are glaring at us that you know we needed yeah. this service a decade ago and we are yeah. already a decade behind your, your numbers are actually shocking to even us Uh, we didn't know that this the magnanimity 400 people losing in a day every day oh yeah. my god this is uh, now i think uh, we will have the same question to you know yes of course our dr gv ramana reddy who is at the helm of affairs in these ems staff so dr reddy dr ramana rao please thank you so much you know i'll just uh, bring some uh, information which is existing in our country at this point of time in the last 15 plus years of uh, initiation of the ground ambulance services we are in a very proud moment that the basic 
life support ambulance services are near universal in this country have this is a support under the national health mission though we have started as a, a pilot project from the civil society in 2005 the government of uh, state governments have come and the government of india has also accepted now it is a part of the national health mission so provision of emergency transportation or emergency medical services is going to be there forever in our country so that's the first observation second is that our basic life support care is near universal either north south east west including north east also we are also operating in arunachal pradesh for example the science of ems also says that 28% of the emergencies require advanced life support care the science of ems also says that the advanced life support care should be built on a robust basic life support care so when we look into the advanced life support care though we have ground advanced life support ambulances and we have started certain boat ambulances in a few selected states in the country now we know because one of the facts what rahul was also mentioning that India has got the highest accident severe. Also, have the new diseases like sudden cardiac arrest. Yeah. So our sudden cardiac arrest rates, uh, cardiac arrest rates are also very high when compared to the other parts of the world. Two hundred and seventy-two per hundred thousand population. to about 12 million and then most of the things you know maternal mortality rate high risk newborn uh, so what i'm saying is that many of those cases which require rapid transport rapid rescue search and transport in the form of air medical services there are a lot of evidences for that but what is happening as an outcome for those patients is no name no game no name no blame so we are not able to quantify how many deaths we are not able to account for this time since two interventions leveraging the aero medical services which are there in other parts of the world i'll stop here yes sir thank you i think uh, you really uh, given why this is a must not an option thank you so much i think now i last dr sai shankar you are a pediatrician and uh, generally what uh, at least <laughs> the perception is that okay these emergencies generally some cardiac arrest etc with some uh, uh, adult population etc now as a pediatrician what do you see of this importance of air ambulance in uh, pediatric emergency can you show throw some light on that yeah yeah thanks omkar um, first of all thanks for having me and i'll also continue with your previous question as to why we need right yeah uh, yes well you know in a very simple nutshell those who are asking why we need tomorrow we'll ask why not why didn't you do it earlier so every new technology when it comes it sounds like fancy futuristic and the next generation says why was it not done earlier so tomorrow we will have to you know take care of these uh, patients who are out there on road and you can't transport them from road you you definitely need our mobility so that is the future we are thinking in future and i think that's the right way to go uh, to answer your second part which is uh, you know about kids in general right yes, now these yes. are Uh, the same population who actually need the services tomorrow today who are kids tomorrow want to take care of their own kids also and i don't think uh, there is room to go wrong there for those uh, for anyone you know having your kid um, in a traffic accident you don't want to be delayed for anything at that point cost doesn't come into picture and that's actually the mindset of most of the people outside india in all fairness where the programs are all financially sustained by governments they don't even think about it and just to highlight this point when i used to be in one of the centers in oxford and melbourne when i and i do a tele consultation and find out a child who is about 200 kilometers away in a small center with limited nurse and limited uh, staff if i feel they're not confident enough you don't even think twice i said get the chopper get the child across and no questions asked because you have placed the life of that particular child over the cost of um you know the air service and i think over time as you said rightly said once the program is established 
the cost eventually will come down. Now, my other quick concern is that, for example, in a rural hospital, suppose some premature birth take place with a child, I don't know, know the situation where it needs some you know, shifting to some other uh, better place, some such situation, can you tell us uh, where, you know, air ambulance is of vital importance? Absolutely. I mean, that's already happening all across the world. In fact, even in India, that's happening. Um, the whole idea is technology is, um, forms your baseline, but making a program around that is more important. For example, if there's a baby who's one kilo born in a small center, I think people have to still do bare minimum things to stabilize the baby before, you know, the baby is airlifted. So that becomes a part of the program, which is, okay, there's an air ambulance service. Let them call, let us call them. And then simultaneously, there's a doctor who kind of guides them what needs to be done because even the 10 minutes is probably going to be a lot for that small premature baby who is the most important thing for a baby is to keep them warm and make sure you don't do further harm. And if that is done, the entire life is actually gone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I think now I'll shift gears uh, to our uh, panel members. You know, there is this uh, question about this medical legal issues. You know, any new technology, what kind of legal issues can it come up with? And especially with the insurance, what is going to happen? Uh, are you, do you foresee any such uh, knots in this? Uh, I think I will start with again, Dr. Satish, uh, the medical legal issues, are there anything on the insurance sector? As a doctor, what do you foresee? Dr. Satish? Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So this is an important question because with the increase in the education and economics, in the medical field, the medical legal things are bound to happen because many people will ask many questions. Uh, I'm sure when we do the air ambulance system, uh, nothing, you know, most of the, these drones when you're creating, uh, on this spot when we have a problem, there should be a doctor available. There should be continuous communication when the drone flies and on the you know, communication will continue till it lands and hand it over to other places. So when these three communications are created very well, that means on this spot or where if there is an accident, it's on the road, some medical personnel will you know, give the radio information and in the drone, when it's going, monitoring, you may not be having the people there except the patient the monitoring system, which is directly communicated with the softwares available to the treating doctor on both the ends, in the beginning and at the end. If the communication is kept in the, you know, and the parameters are maintained in a normal way, the medical legal things become lesser and lesser. However, you know, it can happen in two places. One, if there's a crash, as you mentioned in the beginning, in your previous talk, if there is a crash happens, you know, what will be the medical legal problem, especially if the patient is conscious, you know, patient has salvageable, for example, the cardiac arrest, which the, Dr. Ramanara was talking, where the patient will be resuscitated on the spot, he becomes conscious, and suddenly when he's flying, if he has a problem, that is the biggest challenge. I'm sure, you know, these things are beyond the medical purview, but the technological point of view, you people have to create the safety net you know, which will be taken care of properly, having a tested drone with body weight of the patient, with the technology available, smooth takeoff, smooth landing, and monitoring the parameters. I think with that, the, the medical legal things become lesser and lesser. Yes, yes, I think you are right. Now, I think the already people in the network, I should uh, pass this question definitely to Dr. Rahul. Yes, uh, that's a very, very important question and uh, often uh, not uh, very well uh, addressed. Uh, medical legal, you know, uh, consent for a patient to uh, have access to the personal space of the patient and also do examination and procedure on a patient. Now, uh, air ambulance uh, falls in a very gray area. You're not inside the hospital and you're out there, you know, outside the hospital. And so who takes responsibility? Air ambulance is 80% medicine and 20% uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the cost is reverse, but 
the responsibility falls with the medics the pilots or the drone operators or the helicopter operators are neither capable nor med medico legally acceptable accepted to take that responsibility of handling a critical patient so uh, uh, we in icat follow a very robust uh, consenting uh, process where uh, you know uh, the clinician uh, on site uh, is a responsible uh, uh, person in command and who takes the complete responsibility of the management of the case there's a lot of intervention which needs to happen on ground before take off the lot of intervention which can or cannot or need to happen on route to uh, to the to the destination so uh, the the the, um, the medical legal uh, aspect of the whole uh, operation needs to be very very robust because uh, a lot of interventions are can also be life threatening themselves as clinicians we all know that now coming to the second part of the question the, the insurance uh, until recently uh, insurance did not cover uh, air uh, air transportation but now as uh, Uh, the service now it is in its still in its nascent stage, but the numbers are looking uh, exciting and promising for the insurance companies. They are bringing up products which can cover for air, air ambulance, air ambulance uh, uh, transportation, and especially uh, you know the the, the travel insurance uh, when we do uh, respond to uh, Indian tourists or uh, foreign nationals uh, who come visiting India or neighboring countries. The the the, uh, the travel insurance covers for the air transportation. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good. I think uh, so. Insurance is also resonating with this technological developments. Uh, that is nice to know. Then I think uh, Dr. Ramana Rao will uh, uh, give his opinion on this particular aspect. Uh, Dr. Ramana Rao. Yes, sir. So this is uh, a question which we had uh, a lot of worry in the very beginning. Somewhere in 2007, we have organized a one day. day long workshop with uh, supreme court advocates one judge was also there ips oh, officer forensic medics professor civil society so what at the end of the day the conclusion was in two sentences is very very pertinent for us because the ground ambulances and air ambulances are unmanned things they're all part of the chain of survival what they have highlighted and we are trying to adopt and we are learning in the process even today after 15 years also one is that it says that we need to document even as even in the small intervention or the processes or the vitals very very critical so before going to medical legal challenges i'm saying that we need to document including the time and what dr rahul said i'm using a word called high risk consent now uh, very very important for us to see to that they are uh, in and then we need to create a standard or uh, protocols and there should be a, a continuous quality audit about the variants so that if some medical legal case there should be a preparedness so ems people should be prepared and ems people should be obsessed with the details these are some of the principles which will help in the medical legal cases okay. the the, the th last point i want to tell you is that and compared to other parts of the world in india as far as the ground ambulances are there you know of late the people are expecting a, a quicker response and uh, the majority of the medical legal issues what we are facing are very very trivial so what i want to tell you is that we can be optimistic in that and if the preparedness is very perfect and precise and well thought over the medical legal problems except the workplace violence in india will be higher and i we do not know we need to take assumptions in the air ambulances or such sort of things i'll stop here yeah thank you so dr sai shankar i know you handle with patients uh, uh, you know in fans who doesn't even know that they are undergoing some emergency things like that in at least in other things as okay the patient knows what is at least in some cases knows what is happening around in such cases now what your take on this particular aspect uh, yeah yeah so dr hunga so um, again continuing with whatever you asked right about medical legal aspect in general it's a can of worms you open it you dig deeper you'll find more and more of them so once you have a program which is established once it's up and running you will see that more and more situations will come and you don't know how to deal with it yeah 
that's bound to happen that still happens in many other countries also and i'm sure that's going to be the situation here also and to club the medical legal pass there's also an ethical component right so these two go hand in hand um, just to give you an example you probably in a road traffic accident you have a old patient with a salvageable injury versus a young patient who may not survive the injury and you can only lift one so what do you do there are no sops for that and you can only just take one patient and there's nothing more you can do uh, so one of the aspect of we as a doctor is act of commission and act of omission which are part of the medical legal spectrum so whatever we do we will be in the radar so we again as doctor you know um ramna ro said document even if i have taken a decision to actually lift off the old patient i need to write and lastly about children of course you know they uh, they are not supposed to give a consent uh, unless they are 16 plus and uh, and they are uh, they can in a western country in india of course we still consent uh, from the parent but again there are different types of consent implied consent and informed consent depending on the situation if you have a comatose child uh, the duty of a doctor is to do everything to make that child survive whereas if he's alive and talking then of course parents come into the picture okay now let me take some inputs from you for our industry and for our research purpose also in the sense that today the drone technology has of today we can happily take a minimum of about uh, 10 kg payload to a distance of say about 20 kilometers that's where the current status very you know, we have uh, developed technology towards that now in the light of this if we if i ask you to list out three important applications for in the area of emergency medical services i know carrying a patient okay we will look at it later but this is about 10 kg payload i can happily take now what is the three important applications which you would suggest yes this is needed and which will help our country i will start with dr satish Dr. Satish, you are muted. Uh, your question is: 10 kg, uh, the we can carry transportation as of now. 10 kg. Say payload, I, we can carry 10 kg. Happily yeah. for about the distance of 20 kilometers, let us say. Uh-huh. So I think as of readiness is there. There. Okay. I think that is a good one. If the 10 kg means three important thing, if you are ask me, one is the organ transplant. Second is the the especially the blood which is required at the different places if the blood transportation is required third is the vaccine which is requires to be in the remote areas i think these are the three things you can do as of now with 10 kg fantastic fantastic i think that's that's good also i wanted to look at for example in cases of trauma what is your take will this be of some use you know if you if in case of a trauma if for example you know if there is a head injury or the spine injury the transporting the you know the spine board or the support system the flexible support things which are required for the patient transport that can be mm-hmm. transportable uh, with the basic needs other than that you can't do anything with 10 kg okay okay that that's good i think uh, i will pass this question to dr ramana rao i think you were mentioning some uh, you know the revolution you have done in terms of abc as you called it anti blood clotting system now in the light of it uh, what is your take on this dr uh, we we have uh, done a uh, an action based research and it is called active bleeding control so in the state of telangana where we are operating our average response time of an ambulance is 15 minutes and uh, the police sometimes they reach about 8 minutes and 40% of the deaths in road traffic accidents are because of hemorrhage and there are five way, ways the active bleeding is manifested so we require three things pressure bandage hemostatic pads and tourniquet and this are little costly in the developed nations so what we have done is we have prepared a small indigenous kit and we got the hemostatic pad and we know we have identified two study areas 
and we thought we have done some proof of concept very initial stages the drone will take the active bleeding control kit which is hardly about 150 grams if i am right and it will take this kit and then drop at the location on the road so we have trained about 1040 auto drivers by shop uh, shopkeepers or bystanders and some college bus stand and in out of 10 months we were able to get an opportunity to uh, address about 40 members we were called abc volunteers and we were able to at least anecdotally document about 25 active bleeding cases were controlled so what i want to tell you in the three points what you asked for is Uh, so active bleeding control kit or a relevant or an appropriate including the tonic it can be small size and it can be done with a, a small drone also the second area is blood and third we work in himachal pradesh uttarakhand we used to work madhya pradesh and there in only in two places gujarat and uh, himachal pradesh we are able to carry the anti snake venom but we require this anti snake venom in many areas the rule of ems says that 4% of the terrain or 4% 9 of the 4% of the population will not be able to reach by road because of the terrain challenges so anti snake venom is one the second one is abdis and more than this defibrillator because sudden cardiac arrests are there and it is almost instructional based use of aed is level 1 evidence and i am sure we can save many lives both in urban and rural areas by having a drone being sent and there is a socially conscious citizen or a good samaritan by the side of the victim i'll stop here yeah i think i have a sub question for you dr ramana rao i think what you said is about defibrillator uh, as i understand uh, with giving some instruction maybe a drone can also help by a recorded voice message or something like that is it something that uh, you know what you call as a lay person can use a defibrillator on the needy one and also your abc is that is also something you know you can instructionally manage sir as far as instructional aed is concerned even if the uh, said says that sudden witness cardiac arrest the, the aed gives instructions and uh, there is a, a proof that even if a doctor is there because doctor may also have a panic because the, the patient must be close uh, relative or blood relative the emotional there i'm not denying that the doctors are professional but at the same time the rule book says that the instructional cpr uh, the instructional cpr we has got a better outcomes so it is easy to be put into practice by a lay bystander if there is a trained bystander what we call a first responder all the more it is very pertinent very important to get a good measurable outcomes that's uh, nice to know dr rahul yeah i mean uh, thanks dr ramana that that was uh, the thing i was going to say aed anyway but i'll start with blood yeah so uh, 10 kilos 20 km, uh, kilometers uh, you know in, in a trauma obviously i mean uh, 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 the, the biggest uh, uh cause of preventable death is uh, you know sudden and massive hemorrhage uh, hemorrhages are addressed you uh, you uh, replace blood with blood you don't replace blood with fluid you know a normal saline or any other fluid so um, that is the the trauma protocol that we follow and, and we follow it worldwide so you know uh, 10 kilos package of blood is is good enough to manage a major hemorrhage whether it's on the road or in a matter uh, in a in a high risk pregnancy unit in a in a major uh, metal hemorrhage also you can transport blood uh, you know if you are giving a 20 km radius second is aed of obviously dr ramna has thrown a lot of light on that um, uh, the highest chance of survival after a cardiac arrest is if the patient has a vt or a vf arrest which can be shockable and is shocked in time and the cpr goes on uh, on going cpr the aed arrives if you see what is happening in the the western world and the developing countries and you know in europe or uh, the same every 100 or 50 meters there is an aed available everywhere so you know uh, the casinos in las vegas have the lowest death uh, because of cardiac arrest because they have aeds every 10 feet or something you know i read some article somewhere the all these pointers are 
indicating that the you know, the the uh, the quicker the uh, a defibrillator reaches a cardiac arrest patient, the highest are the ch chances of survival. So uh, that is one. And then obviously organ. Uh, you know, my team is right now uh, um, harvesting an organ in Guntur. They will be traveling from Guntur to Vijayawada Airport. Then the organ will be airlifted from there to Chennai. And uh, from Chennai, it again takes a road journey to the hospital. Now what, we can... what organ is this? Sorry, what organ is this? Heart and lungs. Sir. Oh, lungs. Oh, okay. both okay. heart and lungs. So, okay. uh, so both the organs are time critical. Heart uh, has a ischemic time of uh, four hours. That's two hundred forty minutes. You leave. Uh, you uh, you lose half an hour uh, in cooling the heart down. So you're left with two hundred and ten minutes. Two hundred and ten minutes from uh, uh, cross clamp to uh, implant. So you know. Uh, so a time saved. Uh, you know, if a drone picks up. The organ from that hospital to uh, Vijayawada Airport, and another drone picks up the organ from Chennai Airport to the hospital. You save a lot of time. You cause less of a hindrance to creating green corridors and all that. So yeah, yeah these three are the, the the main uses. If given constraints of ten kilos and twenty kilometers. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Sai Shankar, uh, your take on this? Yeah. Um, if I know you have worked yourself with air ambulance. Yeah, no. If anybody is expecting me to say a two and a half kilo baby, the answer is no, um, because the smaller the baby, you need more number of people to stabilize. So obviously that's out of question. Uh, but if you ask me, um, I kind of agree with all the other panelists here. The um, um, emergency, you know, defibrillator, you know, access to the defibrillator, not only in the area outside, but also within an urban city on a second, third, fourth uh, flat, for example, right? something like that happens for an ambulance to even reach to fourth or fifth floor it's a big deal so that is a very apt number one use case as per me for a 10 kilo and a 20 uh, kilometer kind of thing the second i would put in priority would be a slightly innovative concept where we can actually use the drone to um, provide a video surveillance of the accident site and rely it to the paramedic you know, one of the challenges is when the paramedic is actually approaching an accident site, maybe on a national highway, he has no idea what he's expecting there. So even that preparedness of saying, okay, there are three people, he already knows that one person is sick and two other are probably not salvageable. He can probably contact the doctor. So something like that can be worked out because the, as you said, 10 kilo is a very you know small weight. So just a video serving system is another one. And third in my, in this whole scenario would be blood because, you know, many times, even in peripheral areas, when you need blood, you don't have it. There's a huge panic about it. Onkar. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a... Yeah, uh, Dr. Onkar, if you remember in my first yeah. presentation, when yes. you started this, I told you about the same, the putting the cameras to the opera, you know, the trauma side place. And yeah. then, you know, to the, because most of these things now we are done with the radio system, in a, especially in the rest of the world. When we yeah. were working in US and everything, we used to have the radio communication. From the paramedics to the doctor center but i think and you know, as i was telling even in my first presentation i told you you can connect a camera and relay and many paramedics with the doctors for this thing uh, we direct visualization we can instruct so many things including the defibrillator to trauma care actually after your suggestion mm -hmm. uh, our lab we did uh, an algorithm we developed from the mm -hmm. camera to measure the heart rate Using oh, really Hilarian nice. video magnification. Thanks really for nice. that. I will talk to you later no, about this. No one. problem. How useful yeah. it could be. Anyway, my next question is, of course, related to now. Of course, one, you have said very good applications. I think uh, there are a lot of audience, as you know, we are also on YouTube live. And uh, there are many, I think, I don't know how many numbers. We had uh, nearly 300 registrants. So a lot of people are following and many of them are from uh, the industry. Uh, so the this is related to now from uh, just this uh, 10 kg which I mentioned the payload which is now very easy for us to do. Next level is that okay now we have to carry a human a person which means a payload of about 80 kg is what we are looking at. So there are certain things. The situation is that okay a patient is in trauma and we have to shift him immediately to a nearby hospital. That can a drone do? The answer is yes. Technologically yes. Drone can lift 80 kgs and it can transport. There are a lot of certificate issues, etc., which I'm sure 
the engineering stream will answer that later. But the question is, do you see that uh, that is a good option to carry a patient? How we carry? Yes, there are a lot of biomechanics involved and what do we do with this? Because I know you talk about uh, uh, you know very the good way to strip them and before we port them onto the machine. Uh, suppose that is a possibility. What do you see as uh, the potential of this scheme? Taking a patient from the site of the injury to a site where he can be attended to save the life. I think we'll start with again, Dr. Satish. And I know. One person, one patient on the mission. See, I think, you know, there is no doubt. It is definitely is the need of an hour. So, you know, it is definitely useful. It is doable. I think, you know, only thing is the system has to be developed and drone has to be developed. And I don't think you know, anybody will say no to this technology. I think we should so, definitely let me, let me ask a sub question. In such a case, for example, now only patient is there. Maybe we can, because uh, engineering technology with robotics has fairly evolved, hmm? to provide maybe certain support a paramedic could do. Mm -hmm. Number one. So what do you expect there? Number two, what about the psychology of the patient? See, there are two ways of looking at it. I'm sure whenever you do the robotic system, I'm sure Dr. Ramana will throw some extra light on this because oh, yes. you know when we used to carry the patients in an ambulance, when I was a student, uh, there are only two monitors were available. What monitor? One is a doctor and a patient relative. There are no pulse oximeter. There are no, you know, the ECG machines. There are no monitors available at all when I was a medical student. But over a period of develop, you know, later we developed now the EMS system includes, including some of the portable ventilators are also available to it. I'm sure when you do a drone, you know, to carry the patient, when we come to that level, you will have the technology which monitors all the vital parameters of the patient. Vital, I mean, pulse, breathing, his heart rate, you know, his conscious level. With the camera or without a camera, you know, with LED system to the, uh, you know, so many other technologies are useful now. We use it for both navigation technique as well as robotic technique in our surgery, where we monitor every parameters without touching a patient. I'm sure you will adapt the same thing into the robot. And once that is there, which can be manipulated either from the place where you launch that or the doctors who are there on the other side to receive. We can, you know, technologically, we can monitor this and alter that. And with the robotics available, you know, giving the CPR system, I'm sure the robotic can be taught how to give the oh. CPR technique. Sure, it can be taught. And you can control with all the software from a distance. I'm sure it is possible. That is number one. Number two, psychological point of view, you know, it depends on the distance with which you carry. For example, now we have the similar problem in a patient with when we do MRI, the, in the MRI machine, the gantry is small. If the patient is obese, many patients are so claustrophobic, those who never knew the claustrophobia before, to get into the gantry for 40 minutes to do an MRI, 90, you know, nearly about 30% of the patients are still nervous as of today. <laughs> so similarly, in a close, you know, the drone, you know, how the patient feels over a period of days, we can evolve it. And how to you know mitigate those things can also be done. At least you will have a video conversation with the patients can be done. And yeah. there is a big camera kept at the head end with eye level where you can con constantly communicate family and friends and the doctors. I think that can be mitigated. Yeah, yeah, that's possible to do. Yeah, that's very nice of you for throwing light on this. Uh, we will straight away go to Dr. Ramana Rao. Now, the PE hospital or EMS talks about on-scene care, en route care, and patient handover. They are the three important phases. So when we talk about a drone shifting or transporting the patient, we use two words, transport and transfer are different, right? So what I want to communicate very strongly is that stabilization should precede the transportation. There are certain things like you know CPR or... Uh, yeah, active bleeding arrest. I will give you two examples for immobilization. These are some of the things which. So, if you have a 
a, I would say that a, a, a pilot district where people or first responders available and that can also have this sort of a, a drone right of support for uh, transporting the patients quickly, this will work. Even if it is five minutes, 10 minutes also uh, from the scene to the hospital I'm talking about. Because drone, you mentioned that there may be some competencies because we have uh, Dr. Satish that in a multi-parameter monitor, we have a, a AED nowadays, including all the pulse oximeter also. And uh, uh, if we want to really use only uh, the, uh, the drone, it should have certain competencies that can be discussed. And that sort of a combination would be better rather than a, a, a single drone. It has to have certain competencies and or else we need to have a ground level certain first responders, which WHO in its uh, emergency care framework has clearly identified. So these sort of a things should also be plugged into the entire uh, framework what you have envisaged. That is great. Over to you. Yes, uh, Dr. Rahul, I think you must have faced at least partially some of this problem with patient psychology. Yeah, I, mean, I still get scared when the helicopter takes off, uh, even after you know, <laughs> thousands of hours. I can imagine uh, how a patient would feel in a drone. But you know, uh, it's a very serious question, and I, I I want to answer it in a in a scientific way. So uh, let's uh, you know let, let's uh, imagine uh, you know, why are we airlifting patients, right? Okay, so uh, there's a it's a spectrum. Aeromedical uh, science or aeromedical service is a spectrum, starting from emergency, uh, out of hospital emergency, requiring an aircraft, whether it's a drone or a helicopter or whatever, to transport that patient. That means uh, the, the criticality is such that the patient is unlikely to survive the journey by road. That means that the, the, the patient is very, very, extremely critical. The second uh, stage is a patient is already in an ICU and in an unstable condition. So we are talking about extremely critical in an emergency on road, critical but unstable in an ICU, needs to be airlifted. Third one is critical but stable in an ICU, again to be shifted to another ICU or to another hospital. And the fourth category is stable. They also need uh, you know, air evacuation, uh, air, air, air transportation. Now coming to you know the, the emergency, you know, the, the you know the, the real emergency is on the road or in the metal uh, units in the rural area or you know uh, a neonatal uh, emergency where you know the expertise, the medical expertise is paramount. You know much more than you know, what machine he is or he or she is flying in, whether it's an air helicopter or a small Cessna or, or whatever it is. So you know the, the medical uh, expertise which is required to not only save that patient's life on ground before we take off but also continuing that medical care on route until uh, uh, they, they reach uh, uh, the, the, the desired location. Now, the second one is critical but unstable. Like we've, uh, we've dealt with hundreds of patients uh, and during the COVID times where uh, the patients work in very critical condition and they're extremely unstable. And uh, we had to go there, do a lot of stabilization, even stabilization overnight and then transport. Third one is critical and stable where they have underwent an operation, they are critical, but in a very stable condition, they can be tra transported. And the last one is stable, very stable patients. They don't need any uh, medical care. They're just hand-holding in our language we call. And I, and I see a role of drones in that category, not the, the other three category, as I uh, had already mentioned, uh, you know, aeromedical is 80% medical, 20% aviation, Drones are the next uh, best things which can happen to aviation. We all acknowledge that. But there is a specific role that they play in the uh, aeromedical transportation and transfers. And, uh, you know, uh, as of now, you know, uh, scientifically, if you look at it, uh, you know, uh, an unaccompanied uh, patient should be in a very, very stable condition, should be psychologically pre-optimized to what to expect. And, uh, and they should be able to process that information. And, uh, you know, so that, that is my take on that. Yeah, yeah, good. I think there are a lot of questions also from the audience, but, uh, well, only few we can take because of paucity of time. There's one question from Thomas looking at the 
what i about the medical equipment calibration because of pressure difference i can straight away answer this mr thomas i think the uavs that we are planning to design they don't fly at uh, such heights as do the pressure really matters in terms of the uh, aerospace what you are looking at so that we are not going to go at very great heights so there is no problem with the pressure and calibration there is one more question i think uh, i deem it fit to, for uh, dr sai shankar to take it i think this is question from uh, nvr kiran if i am right he says uh, i think uh, to summarize what he says is uh, we want everything to hand over to the robots because we did mention about robotics he is asking a question that uh, you know we, as humans we need compassion and uh, robots don't give compassion uh, do you think it is good to transfer everything to robots sai shankar i know you work with lot of these children i think you are good to answer this um so this is a good question eventually the answer is going to be yes the journey is going to be difficult you might think that today robots are not compassionate they're just sitting there and giving instructions but with ai ml and nlp so i'm pretty sure you will have yes. robots which will have be compassionate enough the other thing is you know when you're talking about transferring patient this is not a joy ride you know this is the time where they really need to be in the hospital so the psychology at that time is not about too much of talking other stuff you can train uh, the robot to just take care of that particular journey for example yeah what you said is true because this is going to be anyway a short uh, uh, journey uh, that's very true now i should ask hemant do we have more time hemant or what is the because we are almost uh, drawing close i think uh, yeah we still have 4 minutes to go <laughs> okay we still can okay okay so uh, anyway uh, I, i want to jump in uh, doctor yeah, please, Rao, please, if you permit me now please 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 because uh, when we have been uh, working in about 17 states particularly from the public health services perspective mm. uh, for the drone related transport of a patient into different categories what doctor rahul has alluded Mm. there is a scope for piloting this as a part of the intra hospital transfer within the hospital there are certain units which are little far away right so either uh, we use a word called you know uh, fixing moving and lifting on scene and we also use the intra hospital transports so if there are certain uh, hospitals which are spread horizontally and we need to move patient from one department to another department i think if you want to do some piloting using only the uh, the, the the drones i am sure that you know people like rahul and others can also uh, you can yes. they can pick their brains and then pilot that oh sure, sure 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 i think this is a very great deliberation my another concern for example as drone engineers in our country we have a lot of challenges because we have one side we have coastal areas uh, zero meters mean sea level then other side we have sea chin where the drones are very important we expect them to fly at 4.5 kilometers etc altitude variation temperature variation we all the way from 0 to 50 degrees centigrade variations we have deccan plateau north himalayas so the challenges to have a ubiqu a one vehicle which can cater to all through our indian con- country is a big challenge for any drone engineer like that in the emergency medical services when we have to address these issues do you see any challenges i'm sure you have all worked all over the world you know the situation elsewhere compared to the other parts of the world do india offer any specific its own challenges let me start with dr satish you know in fact uh, you know considering the rest of the world india is a tropical country i don't think you know so much a difference will be there doing you know any transporting the patient from place to place especially in the air means i think is much more easier compared to in the rest of the world uh, i don't think any greater challenges you feel compared to uh, movement in canada uh, if you see if you go to the northern canada it completely it is same like ch you know so you will have extreme weather or you know only thing you might find it drone 
temperature variation in the Rajasthan or somewhere, but down yeah. south, I don't think you'll have any problem related to the weather or transportation system uh, problem. I was also looking at, do you think medically, is there some, uh, do you foresee or in your experience, something yeah. particularly which you can tag it as, yes, this is particularly Indian. Yeah, that can be, that is only mean, you know, is the uniformity of the protocol, SOPs, you know, how we use from hospital to hospital. It has to be uniform which is a greater challenge in India because even, for example, if you do the vaccine thing, you know, there is no uniformity between the rural versus the urban or within the urban from one hospital to another hospital. I think when we do the drone thing, we should have a protocol which is uniformly followed by every medical fraternity irrespective where they are. I think doing that is a big challenge, but it should be part of the curriculum of the emergency medical care and during the internship if you create, I'm sure it is possible uh, to do that. But uniformity maintenance is a problem. Yeah, that's the point. So, Dr. Uh, Rahul? Yeah, I mean, uh, it is it is a, definitely a big challenge. Uh, India is very, very thickly populated. Um, you know, we have large number of people living very close by. And it is, uh, you know, geographically, we are a very large country. And uh, we don't have a lot of uh, designated landing areas. Uh, we have problems with overhead cables, which other countries may not have. Uh, these overhead cables uh, may not be, uh, you know, visible. Uh, you know, yes. visible if they are, you know, in, in regulation about, you know, the exact location and side of the overhead cable. Sometimes these cables come up randomly, and uh, and uh, so those will be the challenges even when you're, you know, designing the drones. And of course, uh, you know, we have a very inquisitive population here in India. We are very inquisitive about everything. So crowd control will be a major issue. Uh, as per the DGCS regulations, uh, you need to have a police presence and a fire engine presence wherever a flying thing lands, whether it's a, a helicopter or a drone. So, you know, uh, because of crowd control, they may injure themselves or they injure the people in, in, the, in the machine. Okay. Yeah, I think... Uh... Dr. Ramadarao? Yes, you know, we have two, three conditions where we are having some issues with this uh, external uh, temperatures, right? So we are trying to see to that the air condition system is important. And in the southern parts of the country, while in the northern country, northern parts like Himachal Pradesh, we have a different temperature uh, comforts. So we have two issues also. For example, we have documented uh, the, because of the heat, there are a lot of injuries. And uh, in a heat injury patient, uh, which is not being fully highlighted, but there are a number of deaths. Even in one state of Telangana, in one year by 5,000 deaths, per, you know, we have unearthed that. Now we are, uh, we are working on a, a carbon cool is a device. Newborns, 10% of the deaths are because of hypothermia. Dr. Sai may allude more on that. So, External temperature is very important in certain emergencies. We use a word called environmental emergencies. And where there, if you are using a aeromedical transportation, of course, the temperature control can be done. There are certain, uh, I would say that embrace and other equipment is there. But if with using a drone, I don't know how you would also incorporate this temperature control. Uh, it's a lower side or a higher side. I think your technology team must have to really work on this. Yeah, but we are having some ground level challenges in terms yeah. of the temperature and transport. Not the devices and the equipment, but I'm talking about the patients. I'll stop here. Over to you. Dr. Sai Shankar. Yeah, I think because of lack of time, I'll just keep it uh, yeah, short. Yes, yes. Um, Rahul nailed it. He's right. He's saying, you know, getting the drone in the crowded area and controlling the crowd is going to be a big problem. Everything else can be solved by technology. Yes. You can develop the drones which can fly in any kind of temperature. And we are not in a zone. We are tropical country. So we are not right. going to have so much issues here. But uh, let me, in the light ravine, I'll answer you. When we, 10 years back, when we were flying drones in our own quadrangle, there are three floors. All around people used to stand and watch. Now it has come to a situation when we fly, nobody looks at it. In fact, there are complaints that your lab is creating noise. <laughs> so things have changed. I think it is a question of people getting used to it. There is another question I had, but uh, due to paucity of time, I will bypass that question. But very quickly, the last thing is 
what is your medical education is it geared up to handle these bridging between medicine and engineering is already some efforts going on in the education system or in your hospitals is there something training or is there any like any other faculties of specialization is there any specialization which addresses these issues uh, very quickly dr satish Uh, you know, a very pertinent question. You know, uh, in fact, in the first uh, meeting of ours, uh, the very fact that I came and gave a talk in IAC is because there is a yeah. big gap between the technology development and the medical profession. But believe me, the newer generation are far ahead of us in you know my generation compared to my generation in these technologies. Their way of looking at things, because even the youngsters want to adapt to the technology faster. they have a kind of a vision within themselves to adapt i think the future generation you know shouldn't be a problem but as of now sure there is no you know uh, uh, there is a collaborative things between the technology and the medical profession uh, coming together and doing this but uh, there will be curriculum very soon which will come i'm sure it should start in ias the new medical uh, oh, hospital right. to start with that will yes. be the best thing yeah and before i conclude yes. you know, i have one suggestion Yes, See, anywhere anywhere in the world any new technology which is adapted to the medical field we always used to have the testing in animal models but yeah. now i am a very you know i am not i am a peta man i always love animals don't take me <laughs> wrong so i think the same session you should have with the veterinary science people because now caring for the pet has increased significantly in the urban areas there are a lot of you know pet salons are available even to groom them so i think testing the drone in the pet which is now 10 kg or 12 kg drone you know using the you know medical treatment as well as the caring for the pets or a transportation of the pets if you do with all the parameters monitored their heart rate pulse and everything and testing them from place to place within the city which will give all the problem which human can suffer and you can have your own protocol done i think that is the first thing you have to do if you are a leader in the next to take to the human step which Thank makes enormous much. difference including the protection given a very nice direction for our researchers thank yeah. you so much dr satish and uh, now we will uh, uh, talk to dr rahul on this issue very quickly because we are running out of time i'm sorry it's a it's a very uh, important question sir cannot be addressed in in the next couple of minutes but i'd like to say, yeah. like to say that uh, you know um, uh, pre hospital or uh, air medical uh, uh, sciences and uh, education and training program around that actually does not exist in india right now uh, and in my in my talk which is going to start in the next few minutes i'm going to um, highlight or i'm going to talk about the training program that we have started uh, especially addressing this uh, specialization it's it's called transit care medicine in the west you know we are calling it fam fellowship in aeromedical sciences and uh, we are bringing together the best in the world to train our doctors here as a template we have already done the first batch and uh, we can you know roll out okay that that's good to know yes sir dr ramana rao now we have two uh, experiences uh, successfully one is that our drivers are license holders but mm. we are also considering them as first responders and they are also given the responsibility of uh, scene safety crowd control is a part of the training oh. and we also have emergency management executives or the middle level supervisors and uh, they are all from the automobile engineering and they were all trained in medical equipment they are all trained in management our processes technology and we found that this combination of different disciplines yes. so i would use the ems what is being adopted at the public private partnership is a synergy of multiple technologies yes. medicine fleet technology telemed telecom it and of course management so i'm sure that in the drone context also this synergy would be very very helpful thank you thank you uh, very quickly dr sai shankar i'll answer in 30 seconds omkar <laughs> it's all there out there right everybody has done it we are not doing anything new but it's unorganized is unstructured but we need to strive it to make it in a way that we set a bar and you know rest of the world says hey this is how it needs to be done and that is something which i have never used this sentence before but i i feel i should use it 
that sky yes. is the limit sky is the limit here in this country right? so but yes that's from my second part thanks for your comments anyway thank you all very much i'm sure our uh, audience have greatly enjoyed and benefited from your enlightening uh, comments observations uh, thank you dr satish uh, dr ramana rao dr rahul singh and dr sai shankar uh, for all your comments i am sure we need more of your um, advices in converging this uh, technology of air ambulance and emergency medical services we from the art park and iic thank you very much and we will get in touch with you again because we have a very core team who is uh, seriously working on these things and it is time for us to actually formulate the problem and while formulating the problem we need to address all the possible issues to the possible extent your uh, advices will be of help and we will come back to you and thank you all very much namaste thank you so over to you hemant and thank you omkar sir thank you thank you all the panelists thank you thank you yeah okay thank you very much uh, dr omkar uh, that was really a fantastic and uh, very captivating uh, panel discussion uh, with all the experts in the healthcare community who have either seen uh, such aerial technologies or uh, are directly involved with it and uh, i'm sure it has provided quite a lot of uh, useful insights to all the participants from uh, the human perspective and the real gaps that uh, need to be fulfilled Uh, in the emergency care uh, delivery space uh, such as the abc uh, uh, organ transfer and the monitoring of vitals etc that ha has been discussed and uh, thank you once again uh, to all the speakers for also answering the questions raised from the participants uh, so thank you once again uh, uh, dr satish dr amana rao dr sai and dr rahul once again for this wonderful session uh, <coughs> so, so now uh, Um, do, I, do I log in again, or uh, are we continuing with the same thing? Uh, so uh, we will continue. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I'll stay here. Yes. Okay. So uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Rahul Singh again, uh, whom you have already heard in the panel. Uh, he is the chief of Aero Medical Services at uh, ICAT. and has uh, also a wonderful team of air paramedics that uh, work out of the uh, conventional helicopters in case of med medical emergencies he will now specifically address uh, the air ambulance from the point of view of how it is done today uh, and also uh, what needs to be done to realize an air ambulance that's uh, uh, an electric version of the existing helicopters and the fixed wing aircraft that is Uh, that is both i mean the electric version that is both uh, operationally operationally economical uh, and how the economies of scale will actually change the landscape of medical transfer so <clears throat> without any further delay uh, please welcome uh, dr rahul uh, the stage is yours thank you thank you mr hemant and uh, hello everyone um, uh, is my screen uh, visible i mean i've started the ppt So, uh, just a brief introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Rahul Singh Sardar. I'm um, I'm a trained anesthetist, critical care uh, specialist. I've done uh, uh, my time in UK more than twelve years of uh, training in twelve uh, years of postgraduate training and uh, experience of air medical uh, services over there in UK. Uh, ICAT uh, was founded by myself and Dr. Shalini, my colleague. Uh, We are similarly trained. She was in a different deanery. I was in a different deanery, but had a common vision of coming back to India and starting a, um, a professionally uh, run uh, air medical service uh, uh, at par with what we were used to in uh, in England. So uh, we uh, we started uh, ICAT Health Solutions, and we started the ICAT Air Ambulance Service under that uh, company. Um, Uh, our journey has all you know has started from 2017 when we started the, the organization here in bangalore and uh, we have progressed since then uh, from 
both of us being uh, the only doctors uh, doing the, the service within our company to now um, uh, expanding to uh, more than 25 doctors uh, who work for us uh, and uh, more than 10 perfusionists and about 15 uh, paramedics whom we have trained ourselves and a very robust team of uh, operation uh, command and control uh, center that we have created in Bangalore, uh, which work at military precision around the clock to make things happen. And, uh, you know, we have uh, gone and um, done very challenging uh, aeromedical uh, operations deep uh, into Indian uh, territories where even, uh, you know, even those places which were not accessible uh, uh, by an aircraft where our teams had to go by road to uh, save a person's life and then drive back and then fly. Um, for which we got recognized by the, by the government of India. We were part of the advisory group under Ashwini Kumar Chaubiji when uh, he had the portfolio. And uh, let me go, quickly go into, you know, the, uh, the, the concept about air ambulance service. What are the regulations around it? From the from the aviation point of view and also the medical point of view side, and you know how do you convert uh, an aircraft into a flying ICU? So uh, DGCA, that is Director General of Civil Aviation, came out with an uh, operation uh, with a car document, which is Civil Aviation Requirement Document for Aeromedical Transportation. So there is a regulation about uh, what an aircraft, uh, which is certified as Aeromedical Transport the (AMT), needs to have. A mandatory requirement of uh, you know a set of rules and regulations around uh, the aviation side you know the, the pilots the, the, the number of flying hours and that they need to have under the belt to uh, be a part of the AMT and the aircraft infrastructure to support uh, a patient. Then came the HEMS uh, circular which was the helicopter emergency medical service circular which we were uh, uh, a crucial part in you know giving our inputs and you know, getting the you know the, the the draft civil aviation requirement document now it's become an operation circular where a helicopter uh, traditionally before this uh, regulation came in had to have uh, permissions from uh, the district collector and a, a, you know a set of permissions from the ATC and the DC to uh, even take off and then land at a particular site the minimum uh, time of trigger to response was three to four hours, if not overnight. So uh, a HEM service does not operate like that. I mean, the, HEM, the, the, the crux of the HEM service is that you need to take off within five to 10 minutes of getting a call and you should be able to land anywhere, not as a de designated uh, landing area. You'll never be uh, having enough time for any kind of permissions from anyone. So we were, we were, uh, it was very important for us to uh, be part of the development of this operation circular by the DDCA, where now a helicopter operating under HEMS mission does not need anyone's permission. It can take off within five to 10 minutes of getting a call, as long as the avionics uh, are under as per regulations. And uh, it can, it needs to fly below uh, a certain altitude as prescribed by the DGCA and needs to avoid certain air corridors to avoid the civil aviation uh, and uh, military aircraft. And it can land without permission, again, with a set of uh, safety avionics uh, as prescribed by the DGCA. But the, the document is there in, uh, and we are fortunate enough that you know, the, now we have the regulations to actually uh, start HEMS in the country. Now, uh, Medical Council of India has been replaced now with National Medical Commission. Uh, Sadly, right now, we don't have a training program within India uh, or a curriculum based on ICU patient, but you can, you can appreciate the, the level of equipment that is required to, to keep the monitoring on as well as to, uh, uh, to keep the patient alive. Now, you need to fit all that in that space, in that aircraft. You know, uh, because if you're converting an aircraft into an ICU, you need to have all that to support a critical patient. So that is a challenge in itself. This, uh, I'm just going through some visuals about, you know, a very, very critical patient that we were involved in and we have been involved in, and that's what we are uh, uh, famous for. These are patients on ECMO, that is heart lung bypass machine. This is how it looks like. And this is the kind of aircraft that we uh, have to transfer these patients in. You can appreciate how small these planes can be. 
Now that is our you know, chief uh, uh, director of paramedic uh, you know, provision services, uh, Mr. Niranjan, uh, uh, loading a patient on ECMO. You can see uh, the machine which is keeping the patient alive. That is the bypass machine, which is called ECMO. And uh, and we have you know we have done more than 130 ECMO initiations and transfers in the last eight months. Now, just to, to give you a perspective, the highest number of ECMO transfers which were done were about 160 over a 10-year period uh, from, in a tertiary center in America. That was the highest number so far. In the last one year. And during a period of eight, eight months, we have done 130. By We have a team of uh, two cardiac thoracic surgeons, two cardiac anesthetists, uh, 10 perfusionists, and uh, about you know, 15 other doctors who can support us. So with this small team, we have reached all kinds of world records. And uh, the, most importantly, we have uh, warmed up the, the, the deepest parts of India uh, for, you know, for this kind of an intervention, where a patient is so critical that it's unlikely to survive the journey from even the hospital bed to the CT scan. Where, uh, you know, our teams would go in, they, by, they bypass the complete circulation through a machine to keep the patient alive, even if the heart's, uh, heart or lungs are completely destroyed or completely non-functional. That is called ECMO. And uh, we have done uh, a lot of ECMO transfers. Uh, just a few more visuals of the critical patients that we uh, have been transferring since we started. Again, ECMO patients are being loaded at this time in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Pilatus, which has a carpet door, which makes it much more easier. Uh, that's how an interior of an aircraft looks like. This patient is all on ECMO and inside an isolation pod. I'll come, up, uh, I'll talk about isolation pods and there uh, in the regulations around it and you know what kind of patients that uh, we need to transfer these uh, in, in these isolation pods and uh, this these uh, you know that is shalini my colleague uh, transferring uh, the living god siddhanga swamiji uh, when he was unwell again a few more visuals and uh, this is uh, a neonatal uh, uh, nicu uh, transfer um, system that we have we have a transport uh, incubator, again, transferring very, very critical uh, infants. This is our neonatal team. And these are the isolation pods that we use to transfer COVID positive patients and other patients with infectious diseases. And before we come to HEMS, uh, so you know, these isolation pods are a mandatory requirement for a patient who's, uh, who's COVID positive. I mean, obviously, um, you know, this regulation was brought in uh, in an urgent basis because, uh, you know, the, the, the sheer number of you know, patients going, uh, you know, getting positive in India literally exploded in the second wave. And uh, when we looked at what our colleagues were doing in UK and, and in America and also in Italy, where they had similar kinds of numbers and deaths, um, they were not tra air transferring their COVID patients. They were, you know, uh, uh, that was a given thing. I mean, you know, they were not using the isolation pods, but we imported these isolation pods from Germany and uh, uh, we started transporting. We were the first ones to uh, start transfer critical patients uh, in isolation pods. Now, isolation pod is a small casket which has HEPA filters and it uh, has a, a, its own uh, breathing apparatus. And uh, transferring any patient is a challenge in this, but transferring a critical patient on ECMO was done for the first time in the world by us. And, you know, uh, because you, know, you need to fit in the bypass machine inside the pod. And there, there's a very unique way in which we do that and still seal the pod so that uh, the infection doesn't uh, come out. And then, uh, you know, that is a USP that we have developed. Coming to um, the HEMS, you know, HEMS stands for Helicopter Emergency Medical Service. Sadly, it does not exist in India right now. And, uh, um, uh, and the, the main driving force uh, for us to come back to India was this. The, the sheer number of people dying on the Indian roads and also in the rural parts of India, away from hospitals, uh, could be saved. And that is, you know, there's no brainer. You know, uh, helicopter emergency medical service is basically literally taking the 
the most valuable assets in a hospital and their equipment to the patient that uh, is critical rather than the other way around. Hence is not a transport service. Hence is you're taking the hospital to the patient. You're, you're getting everything you know, uh, at the doorstep of the patient and the quickest way possible. And the quickest way possible is by a helicopter. So, uh, you know, um, trauma would be the major, major um, uh, area where this service can be effectively used. There is enough data uh, available and enough literature and publications available, uh, you know, of hem services being making a big difference in survivability of trauma patients all across the world. And, uh, and uh, so, and the other unique part of the service is, you know, um, uh, uh, which is very unlike any other healthcare uh, service is uh, you have to respond without any guarantee of payment or you, without any uh, assurance of payment. So th therefore we'll have to assume and in a blanket format that everyone is covered. Now they can be covered by insurance, they can be covered by a subscription or they can be covered by the government. That is a different, completely different uh, sustainability model, which uh, which took us more than four years to develop to make sure that the victim that does not pay anything. So the helicopter, uh, uh, the hems also requires extremely highly trained uh, individuals who, uh, given very very limited information about a patient. Uh, are in a position to respond to a site, land in a very hostile, in te technically hostile in the sense there's a lot of expectations from the people uh, uh, around that uh, critical patient and uh, are expected to perform miracles. You know, uh, the HEMS response also depends, you know, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the criteria to call HEMS uh, is in itself a challenge because a, the, 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 the first responder should be in a position to categorize a patient who will require a HEMS uh, response. HEMS response is not cheap. It is a very costly response. It needs to be uh, used in patients who will actually benefit from this. So there is a very uh, objective way in which we have assess a patient, whether it is uh, a trauma patient or a, a cardiac patient or a neonatal uh, patient or a, or a maternal patient. So uh, these patients, are deemed unfit to be uh, transported by any other means than a helicopter. That means they will have to uh, have uh, a set of uh, parameters which are which are alarmingly dangerous uh, in the uh, alarmingly dangerous zone. So I'll just give an example uh, of a trauma response. We use a system called MIST scoring. MIST stands for uh, mechanism of injury, the types of injury sustained. Uh, the vital signs and the time to the nearest trauma center. So uh, this missed scoring can be done by uh, the first responders who are minimally trained. They can be uh, uh, the first responders with a, the, from the 108 service or a, a bystander or uh, anyone, but, uh, you know, given the calling criteria of a given state or, uh, or, or an organization, can do a missed scoring and then they will immediately know that this patient is unlikely to survive the journey to the nearest trauma center. And that's when we come in. That's when uh, a system uh, we have kept in place where um, the, ah. these kind of patients are escalated and, uh, and the response is immediate. We approved the concept of hands in 2018 during the floods in Kerala. We, uh, we had a team of doctors here whom we uh, relocated to Chenganur, which was the, the worst hit area in, uh, in Kerala during uh, the floods. Uh, we were covering a distance, uh, a radius of 500 kilometers. Uh, uh, we, we were covering about 500 relief camps in our area of operations. We had one helicopter, which, uh, which was manned uh, by our team. And uh, we responded to medically, uh, me uh, critically unwell patients in these relief camps. Not trauma, but these were patients in the relief camps who were getting critical. So uh, we were able to do a lot of uh, air rescue. Uh, we were able to land in those uh, the relief camps which are coming. And inside the helicopter, just uh, 
giving you a visual uh, description of how a helicopter looks like uh, when in, 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 in a HEMS configuration. Uh, it has a stretcher, it's very simple, but the, uh, it has uh, the required life-saving uh, uh, equipment now. Unlike the flying ICU, which has which is completely loaded with uh, you know very heavy equipment, you know, whether the ECMO or very you know uh, an ICU on uh, with wings and stuff, Hems helicopter is you know predominantly very simple because this, uh, these are going for a very specific purpose to stabilize and save life and then bring to a tertiary center. Now the biggest challenge that we faced and the big, biggest challenge uh, uh, so far is you know we don't have trained doctors in India. Who, uh, who can be sent in these helicopters. Uh, so, you know, we were part of the, this, the, the, this peace service in UK, but, you know, not a lot of people relocate back to India like us. So that, uh, that challenge we faced and we came up with a solution by conceptualizing and, and designing a training program to suit the Indian, uh, Indian environment and the, to suit the Indian conditions. Uh, we called it FAM, Fellowship in Aeromedical Sciences. Now, how do we make it, uh, you know, at par with the best in the world? We obviously, you know, uh, ring our friends in UK, the part of the system that we evolved from, and uh, and we partnered with the best in the business over there, uh, and uh, they are, uh, are now our faculty in this uh, in this training program. The whole syllabus was written in London, and uh, and the faculty comes from there. We have uh, handpicked and selected. Uh, 12 doctors and 15 paramedics to go through the first batch of, uh, uh, of training for this uh, program. The, the training selection uh, was based more on aptitude and, and their attitude rather than their clinical skills because we can teach them the cl clinical skills. And uh, but obviously they need to have a baseline uh, hands-on uh, skills and experience uh, to be part of the training program. And then uh, we transform them to what we like to call them medical commandos, because that's what they become at the end of the training. They can be uh, flown uh, to any part or you know, uh, to any kind of uh, um, situation and they will be able to manage, whether it's a, a trauma case or a metal or an infant or cardiac, neuro, and, and you know, they will be able to intervene. They will be able to uh, sustain life and save the life and then transport back. So in a nutshell, that is the training program. And, and the unique part of the training program is uh, the last module of this training program, we send them to uh, to be uh, to go through the exam over there, as well as uh, have the actual experience of uh, flying in uh, HEMS helicopters in, in UK. So this is our first batch. And uh, these are the visuals on that. Um, uh, this is in a nutshell what we do. I've not gone too much detail into uh, into specifics of you know the areas that we get in, but obviously you know I'm happy to take any questions if if you have any. So I think uh, uh, there was one particular question uh, uh, from the audience, but that was already kind of taken in the panel discussion, uh, which was on the uh, calibration of any medical equipment if it is, uh, if it is flying. Um, because as the altitude is gained, uh, the, um, the pressure differences arise. Um, so how much, uh, how, how much is the altitude do you think uh, the helicopter gains, uh, especially in the case of uh, patient transfers? So, uh, um... As per DGCS regulation, uh, the helicopter, the HEMS helicopter should not be flying more than 5,000 feet. And uh, if you are taking a commercial airliner, uh, which is flying at more than 40,000 feet, it is pressurized to 6,000 feet. So what you are feeling inside a commercial airline, you will be feeling the same inside a HEMS helicopter. The equipment that I used in uh, HEMS and any other air ambulance I need to go through a certification called Airworthiness Certificate and STC by the DCA, the modern equipment that are in use need, do not need calibration. In any case, right. don't fly to altitudes which uh, will uh, hamper or disturb uh, the calibration in these machines. 
Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahul. I think uh, this was indeed uh, uh, bucket loads of information for all of us um, that you have provided in that uh, session. And I'm sure um, that the things that you have shared were seen uh, by a majority of our participants for the very first time. Uh, and I hope uh, that it will uh, definitely be very useful to all the ecosystem partners uh, who will be associated uh, with us in the development, uh, deployment, or usage of these uh, advanced air mobility aircrafts uh, within the healthcare industry. Uh, so we are in the process of developing these uh, electric version of such uh, HEMS helicopters. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with your support, uh, uh, we could co-create such a solution uh, that would be both cost effective uh, for the end user and also uh, uh, for uh, businesses that uh, will operate such, uh, such systems. Uh, so it was uh, really a pleasure hosting you for this seminar, uh, Dr. Rahul, and we at Art Park hope to continue our synergies together uh, and co-develop such a such a system going forward. Thank you once again very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Anand. Thank you very much, and all the best for uh, developing the, the the electric version. As as I, as I was telling you when we are having a discussion that you know uh, lower cost means more machines, more operations, more lives can be saved. And I equate exactly to you know that more than the environment, I'm more interested in getting the cost down so that I can save more lives. Indeed, indeed. So I, I think going forward, uh, me and uh, some of my team members will uh, will want your guidance on um, uh, exactly the uh, how the business of Hems uh, works and. Uh, when we are developing this electric version, uh, how um, the volume, uh, when we are operating at volume, how it will change the, the economies, uh, especially for a company like yours. Sure. So, yeah, we will definitely get in touch uh, going forward. And thank you once again uh, for sharing your insights in the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, now I would like to pass the uh, baton to... Uh, Mr. Chetan Nayak, uh, who is a close friend of mine and uh, a former colleague at the Airbus Group in India. Uh, well, he's uh, currently working at Airbus Group. I am not. Uh, and he's a specialist in the field of aircraft performance and uh, the airworthiness certification for the aircrafts uh, developed by Airbus. And in this session, we hope to gain a good understanding on what are the elements towards an uh, airworthy advanced air mobility aircraft and uh, how to approach the engineering development of these aircrafts to achieve um, you know, the airworthiness certificate from the authorities like DGCA in India. Uh, please welcome Dr. Ch uh, sorry, Mr. Chetan Nayak. Uh, uh, over to you. Hello, good afternoon all. Do you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So let me share my screen first. All right. So uh, thank you very much, Heman, for that kind introduction. It's my pleasure. I express my gratitude to IIC and Art Park for organizing this event and inviting me for the talk. I'll try to share some information that I have, which will be of help to uh, Art Park in order to develop the advanced air mobility solutions. Before I get started, just a bit of little note that uh, for today's event, I do not represent Airbus. I'm here in my individual capacity. And all the information that will be discussed in forthcoming slides, uh, it does, does not represent what Airbus does and how its approach to certification is. Let me start with an interesting story. So with, with, the, with, the, with the entire race of uh, various UM developments happening across the world, some aviation enthusiasts can get carried away and decide to make an own craft. So one such thing, it happened in 1982, a person called Larry Walters, he tied some helium weather balloons to a lawn chair and had a very good flight. He was able to fly for 45 minutes. He could, in fact, go up to 16,000 feet. But then things did not really end well. He sort of entered into restricted Air Force space. 
and while attempting to land down got entangled in power lines uh, he he still managed fortunately he managed to land without injuries but then he was immediately arrested and was fined 1500 dollars at that time so to avoid such incidences in real life we have airworthiness requirements and so uh, good afternoon everyone my name is chetan and today i'm going to talk about the airworthiness requirements applicable to advanced air mobilities so regulatory requirements they are in fact a consolidation of over 100 years of flying experience in order for us to have a safe air travel they are constantly evolving to accommodate technological advancement they are also frequently updated to address all the shortcomings that are identified along the way while designing producing and operating these vehicles it's a vast field it covers airworthiness of airframe and propulsion it also addresses regulation of air operations air traffic management air navigation services airport infrastructure and what not we already heard from uh, dr rahul singh and also other panelists that uh, it's a vast field and it covers many different aspects i'm going to focus on the airworthiness requirements uh, across the world there are two famous organization who whose job is to introduce or devise the regulation requirements and also ensure that those regulations are enforced and followed by all the operators and aircraft manufacturer in india we all know there is directorate general general of civil aviation whose mission is to ensure air travel safe air travel by enforcing some of the regulations so if i have to de design an aircraft the, a textbook design what will it consist of i need to uh, apply the knowledge related to aerodynamics strength of material aircraft performance controllability in order to have maximum range minimum fuel consumption and also maximum payload this is something that i call as a textbook design but then in order to operate safely there are many other parameters that must be considered so while flying what about if there is an engine burst what would happen from all the debris which are which are ejecting from the rotating components in real life it is going to fly among obstacles terrain the aircraft will also have to handle lightning strikes foremost or and utmost importance is the occupant safety and also the third part third party safety for example people on ground who are living it should be able to fly and in bad weather sometimes very hot and cold conditions also it is important to capture all the previous uh, uh, flaws that we had in design or basically capture all the shortcomings learning from all the aviation accidents and throughout its life cycle it should have enough structural integrity so with these aspects considered in mind we can come up with something called as airworthy design but uh, what i'm what i have displayed here on this slide is not the only requirements there are much more but these are typical examples so moving forward to the definition of airworthiness it's a measure of an aircraft's suitability in order to have a safe flight it involves aspects related to structural strength controllability performance safe operations and system safety in addition to this there can be several other aspects in order to improve public perception for example there are strict noise related regulation for uh, to address uh, 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 noise issues for people living near the airport area and also looking at the safety aspect so safety from the perspective of uh, unfortunate event of terrorist attack or an external uh, uh, attack on the aircraft so in order to apply for the airworthiness certification first aircraft manufacturer has to apply or indicate interest to certify their type design and this application is typically made to the regulation authority the two the two famous ones are the federal aviation authority sorry federal aviation administration and the easa 
European Aviation Safety Agency. Collectively, they agree on something called a certification basis, which will cover all the applicable requirements and an agreement to have means of compliance. After, after the certification basis is established, there is a compliance demonstration or uh, which is done by the aircraft manufacturer through the means of flight test, ground test, and simulation activities. While this is being done, EASA examines each and every aspect carefully, also participates in some of the tests that are being done, and then only uh, say it provides uh, and then only evaluate the compliance demonstration. And after going through it in a very rigorous manner, if all is good, then the regulatory authorities, they approve the type design and subsequently issue a type certificate. Once a type certificate is issued for a particular type design, every, every aircraft which is manufactured, which is conforming to this type certificate is given certificate of airworthiness. And once an aircraft manufacturer obtains it, it is indeed a celebration time because this is in fact the longest time consuming and the most expensive process of aircraft development. So uh, uh, wondering how much does it cost? So we have, we have some public information revealed by EASA. And if, if one needs to develop an eVTOL air ambulance, for, for this to be processed, there is going to be a flat fee of roughly 24,000 euros. After that, once the type certificate is issued, to retain that time certificate, there will be an annual fees of 24,000 euros. And while the compliance demonstration is going on, EASA would be charging roughly 247 euros per hour. So uh, just, just an example, this is a type certificate which was, which was issued to McDonnell Douglas DC-9 in 1965. And I mean, this is just an historical aircraft, which is very famous, but yeah, uh, type certificates are issued for every aircraft before it starts flying or before it starts its commercial operations. So aircraft manufacturer, they have some tuning parameters to play with. As I mentioned, it's an expensive uh, process to be dealt with and it influences the design very much. So in order to achieve safety objective, one can focus on reliability of subsystems, but that can also lead to increased product cost and it would also need very stringent substantiation. Or another spectrum, another end of the spectrum in order to achieve safety objective is to induce redundancy of subsystems, but that will increase the maintenance cost and also lead to complex system architecture. So one has to find a right balance between reliability and redundancy in order to achieve the safety objective. Next, design consideration. So a manufacturer can have deterministic design consideration in order to design the components, for example, for a fixed fatigue, for a fixed machine life, and then instruct operators to replace that component. Also the performance and controllability is something which can be determined using advanced simulation tools. Other approach could be to have a probabilistic uh, uh, determination towards system safety and also gathering experiences from operations in order to establish safety level. And operations, this is the most critical part where one can obtain the airworthiness certificate for restricted operations, for example, like just having domestic inland flights with, with which drastically the airworthiness cost can be reduced or as, as and when the market needs are expanding and enhancing, one can obtain additional enhanced certification uh, uh, certificate, which can then enable operations in more, more uh, generic conditions like under icing condition or more severe weather, or in fact, having long haul across continent flights. So, uh, but all in all, 
uh, what it does is all these requirements they influence the aircraft design propulsion system design and system architecture very greatly so now the topic of the day which is the advanced air mobility for emergency healthcare so so for this i envisage there are many different kind of aircrafts there could be drones which are transporting organs or medical supplies or it could be defibrillator drone one such as you can see here which is developed by tu delft or an air ambulance which is which is developed by israel all these different aircraft will are are fall are they fall under different categories and they have different airworthiness requirement my talk today will focus the airworthiness requirement for the e vtol kind of air ambulance just to brush up some of us might already know the certification requirement for the existing kind of aircraft the famous one is the part 25 or cs25 for the large aeroplane so all the commercial flights that we take they they are conforming to these standards the normal utility aircraft it's cs23 and part 23 Uh, the, these are sort of common, uh, popular requirement among uh, uh, among aerospace engineers. But these, all these requirements, they have provision to provide air within a certificate to fixed wing aircraft and rotor craft. But with the with all the observations that we are seeing in the ongoing UAM UAM development, there are many different innovative aircraft shapes. that are being proposed uh, the, some of the famous ones are seen here from joby aviation and lilium there is there is also introduction of new technology which is not being used in commercial uh, aircraft as of today so that's autonomous flying then all electric propulsion system or hybrid propulsion system with onboard electricity generation and somewhere uh, there are these integrated lift and thrust system which sort of uh, which 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 have blurred the line between a lift producing system like wing and thrust producing system like engine and the most important aspect is the societal aspect where we have to deal uh, if we are talking about urban air mobility we have to deal with complex flying environment and this uh, this is also a very good opportunity to improve the public perception in order to uh, gain the confidence that the urban air mobility operations are going to be very safe they are also going to address the noise issues the environmental aspect in terms of reducing the emissions and overall uh, uh, like the foremost important point will be to save lives of people okay so getting into more details as i mentioned uh, easa and fa they have they are coming up with the certification requirements for e vtol easa has taken the approach of having a new special condition and it has been very recently developed and they have also published something called as means of compliance for more clarity why a special condition because they want to promote innovative concepts and sometimes it may so happen that a particular regulatory constraint is easier to meet and that way one can introduce bias in design so to avoid that and to promote innovative concept yasa has come up with a special condition on the other end faa is working to adapt existing set of regulations to accommodate ev tall aircraft and what faa is looking forward to do is to apply airworthiness requirements from the existing chapters and sub chapters as appropriate so a bit of detail illustration of of how faa is going to address the certification issue is the entry route is going to be the chapter 2117 a or b and for the for the for any non conventional aircraft design there is going to be unique air worthiness requirements which will be addressed by utilizing the existing part from 23 25 27 and all of that 
in, in, in the subsequent slides, I'm going to talk about the uh, airworthiness requirement that EASA has published, something that we can look forward to. And they're, they're not very different from FAA. And typically how it goes is if someone is complying to EASA requirement, the, the same type design can also be compliant to the FAA requirements. So some of the highlights. So the existing, so so the new, so the newly defined regulation done by EASA, they are applicable for an aircraft carrying up to nine passengers. It is not going to have cabin pressurization. That means it will have a limited flying altitude. The maximum takeoff mass will be less than three thousand three ton. Speed will not will not exceed two hundred and fifty knots or less than 0.6 mark. One of the important change that has been introduced for this category of aircraft is to have a flight data recorded, recorded and some of the data will also be recorded remotely on ground station. Another major change is going to be to, to be able to withstand a bird strike. So this is another new requirement that has been introduced in this category. This requirement already exists for the commercial airplanes, which are large, like more than three ton. But for, for an aircraft less than three ton, this is a new requirement. They have two categories. One is a basic, basic aircraft or basic certificate or for the enhanced category. How they are different. So in case of failure, the basic category should be, must be able to have a controlled emergency landing as it exists today. And the safety objective is based on the number of occupants. So for, for a single occupant per, uh, aircraft, the safety, the safety objective is much lesser as compared to people carrying nine, uh, sorry, aircraft carrying nine people. The enhanced category is intended to define safety standard from, for flying over congested area. So if you are looking at air ambulance, which are, who, which are going to fly over urban areas, then it's the enhanced category under which the, uh, the, the regulatory requirement should be applied and why it is different. So as against having a, uh, being able to control emergency landing for basic category, the enhanced category should have capability to continue a safe flight and also be able to land safely in case of failure. And also the safety objective is based on risk to third party plus the occupants of the aircraft. And one of the important and foremost objective will be that a single failure should not lead to a catastrophic impact. So getting into the details. So in case there is a, there is a burst of component from the engine, then the fragments from engine, it should not cause any damage to the fuel tank. It should not cause, cause any fire or leakages to the fuel tank. In case the design features distributed propulsion as, as illustrated in this photograph, the cascading effects should be considered. And uh, it's, it's really the safety, which is at heart of these regulatory requirements. So anything, so if any failure is more probable than one in 100 million flight hours, it cannot be catastrophic. So catastrophic means loss of life and loss of aircraft. So anything which is more probable than this number, it should not lead to catastrophic impact. Next, another one, in order to certify it for the bird strike, one uh, the aircraft manufacturer needs to demonstrate that the bird up the bird size up to one kg hitting the aircraft at 100 speed at, at speed above 100 kilometers per hour in in such event the the windshield or the panel in front of the occupant should withstand the impact and it should not penetrate next one so this is another very stringent requirement so for the energy storage system in case of crash, it should minimize the risk of post crash fire. And it should also delay the onset of post crash fire so as to maximize 
the occupants escape time so essentially to ensure that all the occupants escape safely before the battery pack catches fire all these energy storage system they will have to be exposed to a drop test where the storage system will be dropped from the height of 50 feet and then after that it will be observed that there is no fire or any harmful release within the occupants escape time one of the important things so in in our commercial flights we wear a seat belt which is just two point which is securing around our waist but if uh, for the air ambulance for 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 the people who are seated they will have to be secured through a shoulder harness why because the crash requirements or the uh, or the capability to or the seats the seats should withstand a for the impact of 30 g that means 30 times its own weight in vertical direction and 21 times its own weight in forward direction other few other key consideration so while flying if it encounters a gust it should be able to withstand up to 6 to 6 feet per second of gust intensity for the enhanced category there are also restrictions in terms of the maximum load minimum load factor that it can withstand so the load the structural strength of the aircraft should be such that it can at least take 2g of load factor aircraft uh, coming to icing condition so aircraft needs to be they should be safely operating in icing condition if at all one doesn't need to have icing certification then it should have appropriate means to detect that there is an icing and then appropriate instruction should be given in order to avoid flying under these conditions so again in case of lightning strike the function at aircraft level should should continue to work it should not get affected and within the operational limits of the aircraft it should not do what is being seen in this video so the aircraft should be free of flutter and it should not disintegrate in air like this so all these tests for example are conducted much beyond the operational operational limits in wind tunnel in controlled environment so that we do not see such incidences in in operational uh, and, and in operational conditions another important part is to address the upcoming propulsion requirement propulsion systems so it can be either all electric which we are all looking forward to another uh, another uh, propulsion uh, another kind of propulsion system that is under talk is the hybrid propulsion which is going to revolution revolutionize the uam industry the current as as usual the current certification requirement do not address these new age propulsion system why because they are sort of integrated lift and thrust units also it is it is going to be either an uh, on board electric storage or it could be electricity generation using liquid or gaseous fuel so there will be another stringent set of requirements that will have to be fulfilled for example in case of rotor over speed it should not burst uh, the the rotor should not burst and cause hazard to the occupants there will be very stringent substantiation uh, the engine the the propulsion system manufacturer will have to substantiate by carrying out endurance test durability test and logged rotor demonstration also uh, one needs to address the hazardous effect that can arise due to an impact or ingestion of bird or hail okay so that was that was in nutshell overall the requirements that have been proposed by easa and all the uam manufacturer across the world are going to conform to those requirements so let's have a look at all the status of certification that we see around the world so joby aviation which is uh, considered to be foremost in this race they have agreed the certification basis so uh, if you remember the the steps that i had presented couple of slides back 
uh, they are at the first stage where they have agreed on the certification basis with iasa around one year back and their intention to start their commercial operations by 2024 archer aviation also they are at a good stage where they have already agreed with fa uh, they had the certification basis done by end of 2021 and they also target to have the commercial operations by 2024 Lilium Jet, Lilium Jet, they are targeting both the markets, and hence they are looking for uh, approvals from EASA as well as FAA, and they already have established certification basis with both the regulation agencies, and they also target to have the certification done by year 2024. Volocopter also has been awarded design organization approval by EASA, and also the production organization approval. this means volocopter can expedite their certification approval process some of the critical uh, or significant tests that are actually performed in order to meet certification requirement is the first one is the bird ingestion test where dead birds are shot into engines and then engines have to show that the integrity is still maintained and in case there is a fan blade off everything is contained then there is water ingestion test in case of operations under rainy conditions or hail condition there is also water ingestion test for the entire aircraft and then landing gear drop test where uh, we test the structural strength of landing gear by dropping it completely with uh, while carrying the entire aircraft weight just to touch upon so in case you if you are wondering what about unmanned aircraft system so as of today the unmanned aircraft system there are no regulation requirements to transport humans whereas this can very well be used for organ transplants sorry uh, transportation of org organs or transportation of medicines or medical supplies so there are regulations which which can allow transport of sorry a uh, flying of aircraft which are not more than 600 kg and but they are not meant to transporting humans as of today they do have uh, provision to remotely pilot it or even have autonomous flying nonetheless so uh, this is this is the current status that we have and uh, what all all of us are looking for which will take its own time because of the inherent reliability that we expect in our aviation operations one is to have regulatory requirement for tele operated ev tol that could be one first step and going forward one can aim to have fully autonomous ev tol a good uh, a fully autonomous urban traffic management with the with the help of iot and data transfer a good infrastructure relating to verti ports and also having a distribution of all these uh, new generation fuels or electricity so for example in case of hydrogen based fuel cell propulsion system one one needs to have a distribution system for hydrogen so uh, all these requir requirements they often come around as a constraining one so it is sort of like uh, it could be something which is prohibiting faster development of um but at the heart of it the objective is really to provide a safe aviation mean for for all of us so that's all from now let's move to question and answer session well thank you very much uh, mr chetan that was indeed a heavy session and um, by the way a very informative session and i hope the participants have gained a good amount of understanding on the airworthiness topic especially uh, Uh, on the regulatory requirements from both the FAA and ESR. Uh, one uh, particular question that comes to my mind is, uh, uh, what is the kind of support that we need from regulatory authorities uh, in order to develop uh, such an advanced air mobility aircraft indigenously within India? Yes. So, in fact, that is a very good question. I must say, because uh, as of today in India, we have 
very few uh, we have very limited experience in order to develop commercial aircrafts uh, we do have experience in terms of certifying uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the very good aircraft like LCA and ALH, and also a two-seater aircraft Hansa. Uh, but in general, uh, many of, uh, especially when it comes to FAA and EASA, they have a framework like uh, design organization approval. And what that means is they sort of give more authority, more autonomy to the private players who are developing aircraft. And this way there's a provision to expedite the certification process. So uh, this kind of framework can be developed in India where uh, DGCA, for example, can, can uh, come up with such frameworks where there's a faster uh, certification process. Another, uh, another interest, uh, another utilization could be from the perspective of all the testing facilities that we have available with NAL, DRDO, and ISRO, where we can utilize their testing facility in order to develop our, our design. Uh, I mean, of course, this could be against, I mean, this is something like they, where they can also earn some revenue by outsourcing this and making these facilities available for private players. And also, uh, it could also be a business case for the regulatory authority in order to approve or uh, provide type certificate to, to type design which are being developed by private players in India. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chetan. I think um, uh, we have unfortunately limited time uh, uh, before we break for lunch. Uh, but yeah, I would like to ask one uh, final question to you. Uh, and this is coming from the audience. Um, and I think after having listened to a number of speakers on the healthcare side, I think uh, people are wanting to understand how far away is India from achieving uh, a complete urban and suburban air mobility for using the air ambulance? Uh, is it five years, 10 years, or is it going to be more than that? So what's your perspective on that? <laughs> Yes. So, uh, so as I mentioned, like there are different categories under which one can, uh, one can classify their air operations. So if I talk about basic category, we are probably already having that kind of air ambulance, uh, which is done over long distance, uh, something that we already seen from other panelists today. Uh, if you are talking, if you are talking about the innovative concepts, like uh, being pursued where there is sort of no distinction between lift and thrust systems. And also they're going to utilize all the latest technology for those kind of aircraft and the certification for those kind of aircraft, it is going to take a long time. Uh, why? Because if I look at benchmark that we, that exists today, uh, the, the aircraft, the aircraft manufacturer that have established certification bases today, they start they started their development roughly four to five years back and they are going to take another two to three years before they can see the commercial operations and this is happening when there is already a set of regulation requirements in place so if we have to start today then i would say that it should take roughly around seven to eight years before we can see these kind of airplane airplanes flying in the sky but this Seven is my opinion. Years. Yeah, this is my opinion. If 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 we all work together, yes, it can be expedited very well. No, I think I I fully align with you because um, uh, I mean the engineering challenges. I mean the domain specific challenges are uh, you know a smaller part to deal with. And also time consuming. So, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, with that, uh, we have to unfortunately end the session. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chetan, for joining us uh, in the seminar today and sharing your um, unique insights uh, from the regulatory perspective. Uh, we, we are grateful to host you um, in the seminar and uh, once again, uh, accept our sincere uh, gratitude for attending the seminar thanks thank you very much in fact the pleasure in mine and yeah i extend 
my thanks to isc as well as art park thank you very much uh, mr chetan and uh, with this uh, important session we have now uh, come to an end of our uh, first half of the seminar and all of us are going to break uh, for lunch now for approximately 45 minutes uh, originally it was a uh, plan for one hour but now we'll have to cut it short uh because we have exceeded by 15 minutes in the seminar and we have some very interesting sessions post lunch um on the enabling infrastructure uh topics such as the design of verti ports uh utm and airspace management and uh, also the lastly uh, on the design and manufacturing aspects of advanced air mobility aircrafts so i wish you all a good uh, lunch break and we will resume the uh session on utm and airspace management uh, and specifically understanding the aspects uh, related to the green corridors uh, for the air ambulance uh, and this session will start exactly at 2 pm thank you very much and uh, see you all very soon that 42000 deaths occur in india in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes this is the golden hour could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts art park proposes the aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives it can fly two patients accompanied by a humanoid if required it is equipped with state of the art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations it also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals even when separated by vast distances The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area. Any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108 with its cutting edge sensors analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools The Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured. Can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance. Can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies The Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle 
is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals, even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also 
help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance can be a great aid during a natural crisis just like other futuristic technologies the aero 108 comes with its own challenges aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge very advanced ai and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions we certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of aero 108 can be fully realized nevertheless this could be the next step to the future in 10 years if the aero 108 is developed we will be able to save millions of people not only in india but around the world thank you see you in the future Do you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108. an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives it can fly two patients accompanied by a humanoid if required it is equipped with state of the art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations it also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals even when separated by vast distances The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area. Any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108 with its cutting edge sensors analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools The Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured. Can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance. Can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, The Aero 
comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. Do you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals, even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. 
robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. Do you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals, even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. 
Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. Do you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals, even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. 
We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future. Do you know that 42,000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108 an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives. It can fly two patients, accompanied by a humanoid if required. It is equipped with state-of-the-art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations. It also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals, even when separated by vast distances. The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108, with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to all the participants and uh, the speakers who are already tuned in uh, and watching the event uh, for some of the exciting uh, sessions ahead. And I hope your lunch was not too heavy uh, because some of the technically heavy sessions are up next and are on the way. So our next uh, session is, uh, is on a very important topic on the UTM and uh, airspace management and uh, especially providing a green corridor for, for the air ambulance, um, which we are looking for. Uh, and this session will actually be delivered by uh, two speakers, Dr. Devashish Ghosh and Dr. Ashwini Ratnu. Uh, both of them are professors in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science. And um, just a quick background, uh, uh, both the professors are uh, uh, working in um, mainly in the area of guidance and uh, control of autonomous vehicles uh, with focus on uh, the aerospace and the underway, underwater vehicles and um, uh, topics like uh, guidance theory, vision-based uh, navigation, collision avoidance, path planning, tra trajectory optimization uh, are some of the uh, areas of current uh, research for uh, Professor Ghosh and Professor uh, Ashwini. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, we can, uh, I would like to hand over the session to, to Dr. Debashish and Dr. Ashwini, who will both share the session on, on this topic. Uh, please welcome, uh, Professors, uh, sir, over to you. Thank you, Emant. Um, 
So uh, we will be talking about UTM and airspace management, uh, providing a green corridor for the air ambulance. So first of all, let me introduce the team which is working on this project, um, uh, sponsored by the Robert Bosch Center. So Professor Devashish Ghosh and I, Ashwini Ratnu, we are the investigators uh, on the project. Dr. Vinay Reddy and Dr. Shuvrangshu are postdoctoral fellows. Dr. Lima. Uh, had finished her studies and was part of this project. Then we have uh, Sajid and Samiksha as PhD candidates and Ashay, Omkar and Mohit uh, working with us as, pro as project staff. So first of all, let me introduce to you a comprehensive and novel uh, drone mobility framework known as Corridrone that we have proposed as part of the effort. So Corridrone stands for Corridor for Drones. And in this um, framework, what we have are some very important features that is corridors and lane planning. Now, all of us know that when we imagine drone traffic, we would also like to have some sense of confinement to that uh, drone traffic because uh, first of all, there could be airspace restrictions uh, while using this airspace. The other thing is that from a ground control point of view, you would also like the drone uh, traffic to be along certain or passing close by to certain points for close, closer monitoring. The other concern is that we also don't want the drones to fly in all directions because they can also you know, interfere with avian species and their natural habitat. So it's very important for us to understand that we are looking at corridors and lanes within. Now, geofencing is a central idea in um, aerial mobility and conf confinement, which we will be talking about in more details as we move on. Uh, compliance level is a novel aspect that we have introduced as part of uh, the corridor framework, where we are looking at the maneuver and the navigational capability of a drone using a corridor. And that's a very important aspect because if the drones are of different types and um, capabilities, then obviously these paths have to be sensitive to that. Uh, levels of safety and airworthiness are essential parts of this. And the other thing is that this whole corridor structure has to interact with uh, an unmanned traffic management system. And we have provisions for that in our uh, work. So coming back to the focus of today's workshop, so we are looking at an air ambulance. So in this regard, what matters is a quick deployment uh, of the system, the portability so that we can take it to places that we are like very new to. Reliability of any system is important. And patient comfort is another factor that we all appreciate by now. So in achieving these features, some of the um, interesting aspects of the Corridrone architecture are the following, that we are looking at a three-layered geofencing. Uh, the paths that are designed are also sensitive to the passenger comfort, which can be related using the notion of curvature of a path. So we are also uh, having a very close eye on that aspect because passenger comfort is paramount. Uh, we are also looking at a situation where we have multiple UVs moving in an area, and hence we are looking at an efficient and quick sort of deployment of multiple UVs through these uh, corridors and lanes. Negotiation with UTM uh, is again an important aspect. And conflict resolution is an obvious uh, um, thing that would emerge when you have multiple uh, drones using an airspace, collision avoidance and other trajectory planning problems will also surface uh, when we reach there. So let me just give you a a brief overview of what do we mean by a geofence. So geofence is essentially a virtual boundary in a three-dimensional space, as you can see on your screen. And this virtual boundary um, helps us in two uh, prominent ways. One is that it demarcates areas in which the drone should not fly or should be within. And the other interesting aspect is that uh, the geofences themselves can be used to generate control forces by the virtue of knowing the position of the drone. We can come up with algorithms that can generate 
forces depending on the position of the drone relative to a geofence so that the drone remains within a geofence. And of course, it is a virtual construction, but it is very important from both confinement and control point of view of a drone uh, doing these kind of missions. So just a little bit of technical detail here. So in our work, we have proposed a three layered uh, uh, geofence system where, as you see on your screen, the innermost is a geofence around a drone. We call it the core geofence. Other drones should be sensitive to that and should not enter that area around another drone. So that is the core geofence. Now we ha typically have traffic moving in one direction within a lane, which is the blue sort of uh, cylinder that you see here. So that also has to have a geofence for confinement of all the UVs or drones using that lane. So that is the, um, the intermediate or lane geofence. And then of course, all this is packed into a corridor and that has its own outer geofence. So these, this is a three layered geofence solution that we uh, offer catering to all these uh, factors in the uh, lane and corridor design. Now I have a short video for all of you where we will see a, a complex structure of geofence just as a test case and see how a drone moves through that and how we are able to detect its position with respect to the boundaries. So this is generated using the SDF function in uh, Gazebo. So the drone flies through given waypoints using a basic uh, trajectory uh, following algorithm. And I would like you to pay attention to the numbers that you see on the screen. So the uh, SDF allows us to constantly monitor the relative position of the drone with respect to the geofence boundary. And the negative number here indicates that the drone is flying within the demarcated geofence. All right, so a little more on these lanes um, inside a corridor. Now we are slightly in more intricate portions of this work. Uh, so first of all, we are looking at C2 continuous path. That What that means is that paths should have continuous curvature and curvature is closely related to passenger comfort. So these paths have to satisfy these conditions. The other um, aspect is that, uh, look at this scenario at the right bottom of your screen. Imagine that you have a start location for a medical drone and also a destination where it has to reach. So the first cut path planning solution is to find the shortest paths between these two points. And there are algorithms uh, that we have developed that do that. So that's a first cut solution. But then around the corners, you will have to smoothen the paths so that the curvature continuity is maintained. And hence you create an outer corridor for drone mobility. And now comes the question of the lanes within that corridor. As you can see on the left hand side, these are the three lanes that we have, for example, considered um, inside these corridors. And this would facilitate both an efficient use of the corridor and also a multi-directional use. For example, traffic can go into the de tourist destination in one lane, and then it can use the other one for coming back. And there could be another lane for servicing and emergency purposes. Fine, coming back to the uh, medical application scenario, we can easily imagine that uh, we might be using a single corridor for the air ambulance, but uh, looking at a situation where we need to quickly transport medical equipment or medicines, then we can also imagine a situation where we'll be using multiple lanes for a quick and efficient transfer of medical supplies. So all this is very closely tied up to the uh, theme that to, we are debating today. Right. So coming to the, the innermost element of designing these lanes within a corridor, this is where a very interesting set of constraints come in. One problem, uh, one aspect that differentiates um, the uh, 
the drone mobility problem from a general compact packing problem is that a drone when it flies uh, because of the aerodynamics it generates the downwash and that downwash can affect the motion of neighboring drones so that is an important factor to cater when we design these lanes that these lanes should not have the downwash interaction between them so a pure mathematical solution to the problem would look like something you see on the left on the screen but for our problem what we are looking at is um, a solution which is sensitive to downwash the other factors that we uh, take into is the shortest path to the destination that i have uh, talked about that you see here the other concerns are the turning rate of the drones which use these lanes and also that once we have the central lane we would like to quickly generate the other lanes using some transformations and on your right uh, bottom of your screen what you see is that this is a situation where the downwash from one drone can affect the motion of the other drone now using all these um, elements we optimize the path and what you see here is a situation where we have a corridor with 10 lanes and this is what the optimized arrangement of the lanes is within the corridor and let me just play this video uh, you can also see on the right bottom that this was the um, the uh, corridor design from the start to end point and within this the corridor these are the lanes that's the cross section and this video will give you more details about this So please note that this design is sensitive to all the factors that we have noted that is passenger comfort, the downwash effects, the turning capability um, on a curved section and all that. Right, so with that, I would now like to invite Professor Ghosh to continue with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Uh, if you may go to the next slide. Yes. So till now, uh, what we have looked at is a corridor architecture which would help in regulating traffic in the class G airspace. However, the corridor architecture is a very general architecture. For the purpose of the air ambulance that we are talking about, it would suffice if we have a, if we use this architecture to create a corridor, then we can take the drones from one point to another point. However, the corridor architecture is way more general than that. It can handle a large number of drones also in the vicinity. And one of the things that is very important here is how do you handle intersections? That is multi-lane intersections. If there are several uh, corridors that we have dis designed, then they will intersect. This is a case that we haven't seen till now. So for that, we have developed algorithms that will manage smooth transition of vehicles at the corridor intersection. And it will also facilitate the option of lane change while avoiding collision with other UAVs in the same corridor. If, in the next slide, we give a brief account of how do we avoid obstacles. For example, we may have moving obstacles in the class G airspace. One of the things is a rogue drone or perhaps a bird that comes in the way of the drone. So we have a way by which, as, I, as you can see here, you can actually change the corridor geometry completely in order to avoid this obstacle that is obstacle or a moving object that comes in its path. There are other ways by which you can also do this, but this gives you an idea that this corridor architecture has adaptivity built into it where you can create corridors almost instantaneously that would avoid obstacles or rogue drones that may come in the way. So there is a small video here which shows how this actually happens, but we will not go too much into the details of this, which shows how the corridor architecture can create new corridors. So in the next slide, so when we have done all this algorithm development and all that, uh, 
we need to convince others by actually carrying out experiments. So first, we carry out experiments in our lab. So this is a motion capture lab, mocap lab that we have, in which we show how the drones can pass through corridors which are created using the geofence idea. These are virtual corridors, so they have been shown here for you to see. So you can see that the drones pass through the corridors. They keep within their own corridors or within their own lanes as they go from one point to another. They can handle curves or curvilinear trajectories without causing concern for the other drone. In the next slide, we have another video where we show how drones can handle intersections autonomously by reducing their speed or slightly changing their direction. So this is what you see here. If you run the video, yes, you can see that there are two drones. Again, inside the mocap lab, you see these drones that are coming towards each other. One reduces speed and it just passes through without damaging each other. So these are just a snippets of the algorithms that we have developed. However, all that we have done here is inside a lab. So inside a lab is we are supported by all these motion capture system, which is a battery of camera, which are looking at what's happening in the, in the lab, what is happening to the drones, use that information and then generate control algorithms. This is not how an air ambulance will work or any kind of real drones in a class G air space will work. So we have to take this algorithm. Now that we have validated it in the uh, lab, we need to take it out. So in the next slide, one of the sensors that are absolutely important for us is something that we use for localization of the drones. We need to know where the drone is. So accuracy is very important. So here you see some experiments we carried out with RTK GPS positioning. And in this, we show that in a distance of about one kilometer, as you see in the picture, from our rooftop of the aerospace building to a high building in the campus, which is nearly a kilometer away, we can get accuracies of about two to five centimeter accuracy, which is good enough for our purposes. In the next slide, now I will show you how the geofence actually works in an actual airfield experiment. So this is where we have now moved out of the lab and we are now in the field. So when the video starts, you can see that the drone is now passing through this geofence that has been created by, its, by it. And you can see that as it turns corners, it goes off its trajectory and comes close to the boundary of the geofence and is again pushed back. This is what Ashwini was mentioning that these geofence can be used to create controls that will keep the drone inside the geofence. This is very important if you wish to send an ambulance over a very long distance. You wouldn't want them to leave their the corridor or the corridor and go outside. So this is a validation of, of many simulations that we have done. This is an actual field experiment that validates the corridor architecture that we have developed till now. Now in the next slide, apart from all that you have seen here, there is also some, we also need to develop what is known as a ground control station. So we have done that. And this is where you see the graphical user interface, the GUI for the GCS where a human operator can monitor the progress of the air ambulance through the corridor. So we have various things here, speed, direction, a lot of other information, altitude, which sector the uh, vehicle is flying and so on, how much distance it has covered, how much it needs to go, whether it is comp complying with all the requirements and so on. The, human operator can monitor all that and if necessary, can always interfere and interject into this. In the next slide, you will see the complete corridor system architecture that we have developed. So this has four layers. The topmost layer that you see is the existing UTM, if it exists in that area. The second one, the one just below that is the corridor server, which interacts with any UTM that may exist in that area so that it can reserve its lane and create a corridor and pass through the corridors as it, as it flies from one to the other. This is a very general architecture that we have for the corridor server, which can create several lanes inside a corridor, several corridors, 
intersection of corridors and so on. After these, we have the third layer. This is the, uh, in the previous slide. We have the ground control station. This you just now saw. This ground control station now continuously interacts with the corridor server as well as the UAV. Now the bottommost layer, we have the UAV onboard modules which monitor and control the operation of the UAV itself. The GCS also gets inputs from there. In the next slide, we have details of how the Corridon server communicates with the UTM and with the, with the UAVs which are flying through the Corridon architecture. So you have the details of these. I will not go too much into it. This is just to show you that all these have been developed and they are form the backbone of the Corridon, Corridon architecture that we, are, we have developed till now. So, Thank you very much for listening to this. We have a lot more of results in these, but since this is a small half an hour meeting, we just showed you some snippets of what we have done, different aspects of the corridor architecture. And just to emphasize that why this corridor architecture is very important is that designing an in an air ambulance and flying it from one point to another is certainly a very tough job but you also need to create a whole infrastructure around it that will help this air ambulance to pass through just like in passenger aircraft just flying the aircraft from point a to point b is not just what you need you also need a whole infrastructure of atc operators communication network and so on in order to take this flying vehicle from one point to another. So this corridor architecture that we just now presented to you, it gives you that architecture that you would require to monitor and convey or transport an air ambulance or any other drones or any kind of goods carrying uh, autonomous vehicles through the class G airspace. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk and we are open for questions. Well, uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Debashish and Professor Ashwini <clears throat> to address the topic on UTM. Uh, and a lot of things uh, got clarified today. Uh, you really have a wonderful team of uh, research staff and students working uh, under your guidance uh, to be able to solve this crucial bit uh, in the ecosystem. <clears throat> and uh, it was really fantastic to see those experimental videos uh, uh, that is also a confidence booster uh, for a lot of people, especially for people like us who are uh, trying to build a business out of it. And also for the regulatory uh, authorities, uh, they will certainly get some confidence and uh, it will be really helpful for all the ecosystem players. Now, I will uh, ask you a couple of questions, uh, but uh, <clears throat> since we have limited time, those questions uh, can be restricted to only a couple of them. Uh, so these questions have been raised by the audience. Uh, one in particular is on connectivity, uh, which is related to 5G technologies uh, and also the edge computing. How will they fit into the uh, advanced air mobility uh, solution? Well, right now, uh, of course, I can see a role for uh, uh, edge computing, but more important is the communication aspect because we need to have very good communication between the ground control station and the UAV that is flying or the air ambulance that is flying. We need good communication between the ground control station and the existing UTM in that region. So these communications are very important. Apart from this uh, top layer communication, I would say we need internal communication where the UAV will, con will get information about its environment and also about how it, and the GCS will get information about how the UAV is flying. Is there a problem? Can we step in and do something there? So communication, this continuous communication, especially in the 5G regime is absolutely important. Okay. Thanks like a lot. Yes. Yeah, uh, I would uh, just like to add that um, if you look at autonomous mobility for a, uh, from a point of view of a ground vehicle, you see that vision is um, 
a paramount sort of sensing information. And if we are looking at local decision making for uh, these drones, then again, uh, so the biggest concern there is computational burden. So advanced computational um, methods or technologies would play a very important role in making a lot of these operations more autonomous, particularly from a navigation point of view. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini. Uh, second question is, um, is uh, related to policy changes. Uh, so it says, what policies, policy changes should be made at uh, national and international levels to encourage these new products and reducing their time to market? Although it is not directly related to our work, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we are always often asked this question that if you at all develop this, when do you think it will be implemented? So a large part of the time is based on the policies that the government will put in place. So this is something that doesn't affect just what we are doing, but also affects the whole development of the air ambulance that is happening here. So my estimate is that right now we have a government which is very sympathetic to UAV traffic in the class G airspace in India. And if we exploit that sympathy now, we use that sympathy, I think we should be able to get things going soon. Hopefully the policy makers will cooperate with us in this. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, one last question. It's uh, from a student, um, an instrumentation engineering student. So how can uh, students from such backgrounds contribute to the development of this sector? Ashwini, would you like yes. to take that question? Yeah. Yes, that's, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I would like to state that instrumentation is uh, and control is perhaps at the center of all this. So a, uh, a training in uh, instruments and sensors is very important for developing these drone systems and also related aspects of control engineering to develop these solutions further. So instrumentation engineering is, I think, uh, would find a very natural fit in uh, this uh, overall effort, apart from other uh, techniques like communication engineering and uh, design and so on. Right, right. Well, I hope, uh... <laughs> the uh, questions to the audience uh, participants have been answered. Um, but uh, from time to time, I think uh, we will have a smaller uh, version of this kind of a seminar where uh, Professor Debashish and Professor Ashwini will continue uh, their engagement uh, with Art Park and uh, will provide further insights as they progress into their work. Um, and uh, hopefully it's going to be an exciting future ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Debashish and Dr. Ashwini for, for this session. Uh, Art Park is really grateful with your presence. Um, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for us too. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, so our next uh, speaker is Mr. Hans, um, and he will be joining us today from Sweden. Um, so Mr. Hans is responsible for uh, strategic advanced air mobility projects uh, at uh, independent business group in Sweden uh, and focusing mainly on the implementation of a nationwide uh, infrastructure, uh, including the ground and uh, airspace uh, for drone transports. And uh, Mr. Hans is, uh, has a senior management background in, in the uh, research and development and also communication. So with that introduction, please welcome uh, Mr. Hans, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Bangalore, uh, Sweden calling. So thank you very much, Emma Jama, for inviting me to this and what I think is an important seminar. Uh, I will give a quick presentation and I will end with a short video about uh, uh, Vetterport concept that we believe in and that I hope will give some, some new ideas on how to go about this future. Um, let me see here now, I will share my screen also. 
can you see my my presentation now and see if yes there you go okay um Okay, hmm, she's green. So is it full screen now? Okay, thank you. Um, technology. Okay, so um, I will give a little talk about better ports and supporting airspace and ground infrastructure and a snapshot from, from Sweden. Uh, see here now if this works. Uh, there you go. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, IBG, Independent Business Group, to you. IBG is an infrastructure company in the aviation uh, and advanced air mobility sector. And um, our competence is to optimize airspace and airports and uh, AAM infrastructure. Um, we uh, have a strong track record uh, with over 90 successful projects in Europe, Middle East and Asia and Africa. We are a Swedish company, but we were formed and founded back in uh, 2007, um, a Swedish guy uh, from the city of Norrköping founded us and uh, he was currently living in, in Asia by that time. And um, after um, a few years, uh, we moved back the headquarter to Sweden, but are still active around the world. Uh, besides doing our business with airports, uh, we work as advisors to municipalities and regions on AAM infrastructure. And we do that uh, through provi providing training through seminars and workshops and also help with implementation of infrastructure for drone transports. So the big question is, uh, what if we could provide medical aid within the hour? And this is a highly relevant uh, question, even in Sweden. Sweden is a fairly big country to European standards, and, uh, but we only have 10 million people living here. And, <laughs> and we have also a very centralized uh, healthcare system resulting in a long distance travel to, to get medical care. Uh, of course, depending on where you live. <clears throat> Mainly, this is uh, true in the northern part of Sweden, which is two thirds of Sweden. <laughs> uh, we, we have uh, a number of projects um, uh, around Sweden. Um, and it's the, with the purpose of, of, of uh, saving lives and also pro providing fast test results. We have a number of, of projects uh, where we fly defibrillators, <clears throat> mainly around cities where the ambulances have a hard time to, to uh, get through uh, fast enough, but also in, the, in, in rural areas where medical aid is, is, is far away. <clears throat> uh, we have also had some, some pilot projects uh, when we, where we fly blood samples. Uh, to see how they, uh, if, if the quality is uh, the same uh, at arrival as they were when, when, when they were sent away. And we do this in, in different climates and, and different weather conditions. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, we're also uh, performing COVID uh, uh, tests with uh, flying COVID tests in the very part, uh, very northern part of Sweden. <clears throat> and uh, this has been very successful because there's a lot of small villages that uh, lack of uh, healthcare centers. They have what we can, what we call um, health rooms uh, where we uh, can, can uh, store and provide uh, 
vaccines and, and uh, different types of tests. We also have Swedish manufacturers and operators uh, working around the world running uh, similar tests, uh, flying vaccines and blood samples. Uh, the picture to the right is from Uganda, um, where we have uh, been very successful. Uh, IBG is not part of that project though, but it's, it has been a very successful, su successful project. So let's talk a little bit about infrastructure for drone transportation. <clears throat> this picture captured the situation in the world today as we see it as an infrastructure company. We are talking about the eVTOLs and the needed infrastructure, but if this would be the car industry, we would have the cars, but not the roads and uh, billions of dollars are invested in, in into the drone manufacturing business but to talk about and the development of the needed infrastructure haven't really started yet as we see it. at least not here in europe <clears throat> there are regulations um, being developed and uh, we we uh, we foresee uh, uh, an implementation of drone traffic here in Europe, Sweden, within five to 10 years. And the, we are talking about the bigger drones than that carries two to four people or uh, ambulance drones. So, and um, the picture to the right is from a project that we, we, uh, we are part of here in Sweden. Um, there's a big, big, uh, uh, a project called the Very Large Demonstration uh, here in Europe, uh, conducted by the Eurocontrol um, <clears throat> organization. And we are part of the, the Swedish work package. Uh, there are seven work packages around Europe and Sweden is one of them. And we are conducting the first um, official intercity flight uh, completely autonomous beyond visual line of sight with cargo between the cities of North Shopping, where we have our headquarter and Lin Shopping, the neighboring city. Uh, fly, uh, a car drive between Lin Shopping and North Shopping normally takes an hour plus, but with the drone, it will take only seven minutes as calculated. And what you see here is uh, our first complete design of a uh, air, air corridor where the drone will fly from a uh, outside a military airport uh, in Lin Shopping, the city of Lin Shopping, to the civil airport in the city of North Shopping. So anyway, <clears throat> we all need know that we need approved uh, takeoff and landing platforms uh, in an infrastructure for, for drone traffic. In Europe, we have EASA currently working on the regulations uh, regarding vertiports, and the industry have started working uh, on their different designs. And there are many suggested designs, mainly from the, from the drone manufacturers but we think there's too much grand design approach to vertiport development to uh, make this affordable for the cities or the smaller villages. So this is an example that you might have seen it before. This is uh, from a German company called Lilium. And uh, they have uh, an idea about a smaller type of airport for uh, Evitons. And this is, I believe, from a, a British uh, architect firm, and um, it's a futuristic design, but we think that there, that there are too, too many moving parts. Uh, we have lifts um, going up and down, and 
we think that will be a little bit uh, too expensive and also very expensive to maintain uh, over the years um, in order to, to, to make it work properly. And we also have designs like parking houses, the one to the left. And uh, the picture to the right is uh, about the huge complex uh, plan to be built outside Orlando in the US. <clears throat> they are all relevant in their own context, but we at IBG think that we need a more budget-friendly approach to uh, make this affordable for regions and municipalities. Uh, in Europe, we estimate that we would need uh, a verity port per 3,000 inhabitants. And that would, with European standards, be a lot of verity ports. Uh, and I don't think we can plan to build uh, big designs like these ones that you see on the pictures. So, what is a budget-friendly approach to, uh, as we call it? Well, we, we like to think of uh, providing an infrastructure with a bus stop strategy, as we call it. Smaller modules uh, easily placed in the cities uh, as well in rural areas. So this is um, some uh, uh, vertiport uh, and a module, modular based vertiport design that we are a part of. And we call it cookie jar, uh, mainly because we had a cookie jar when we thought about how to do, to do the actual design. <clears throat> um, the vertiport itself, uh, the first one up to, on the upper left is about 50 meters in, uh, in, on, on each side. And the, um, the terminal or the bench in the background is actually uh, the uh, 20 feet uh, shipping container where the, where the vertiport is uh, stored away and you can so you can easily move it uh, from one place to another. <clears throat> and because it's module based, you can also build bigger ones, uh, bigger uh, vertical port or drone ports. I think people call them drone ports when you have uh, bigger takeoff and landing platforms. Uh, on the bottom left, you, you can see the, uh, the vertiport with four start and landing uh, platforms. And we are also working on a system for batch landings where we, you can uh, land four drones simultaneously. And on the upper right, you can see a picture uh, from the Stockholm uh, waterfront. Uh, where we have placed a uh, vertiport on one of the, the uh, case you, you can you can call them. Um, so um, let me show you a few slides about the project in the northern part of Sweden. <clears throat> where we probably won't build any more highways or railroads. And if we would, it would take a little bit too long to, to make it happen. Uh, infrastructure uh, projects normally takes about 20 years. And we think that AAM could be a solution to provide a full service to the inhabitants up in the North Sweden. Uh, because it won't take that long to, to uh, work with the airspace design and, and also uh, provide a ground infrastructure feasible for, for uh, providing all kinds of services. <clears throat> so where is Sweden? 
and how big is it? I think Sweden is about uh, only 15% of the size of India, but we're a fairly big country to European standards. And uh, you can see the purple part in there is considered the northern part of Sweden uh, from a Swedish point of view. And you can also see Sweden uh, in comparison with the other countries in, in Europe. So, a little bit of background uh, on this uh, slide. In Sweden, municipalities have, the, have a planning monopoly. And uh, we think that it also will entail the planning of the lower airspace. Not doing the actual airspace design, but doing the actual planning together with uh, professionals in airspace design. Because we know we as we we see it, it's the municipalities and regions who knows where the people lives. They know where the businesses are, the companies, and the needs of the local uh, uh, the regions and, and and the local municipalities. And therefore, we think they will be key in in uh, planning the lower airspace. In uh, region ten, uh, it's. 10 municipalities uh, working together uh, for just as a survival strategy. They are buying services uh, from each other because they don't have uh, all the people they need uh, in, in all the different departments. Um, and um, therefore they are collaborating. <clears throat> and uh, they understand that uh, they need to come up with an idea on how to uh, build a uh, an infrastructure where 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 uh, we can have different types of uh, drone transports because this is uh, part of that uh, the part of of, of the of Sweden where we won't buy any more roads or railroads. And, but there's also a lot of industrial uh, investments going on there. We have uh, fossil free steel uh, manufacturing uh, plants are being uh, planned and, and built up in the northern part of Sweden. And we also have battery uh, factories uh, being built. I guess you have heard about Norfolk maybe. Um, and there are some 700 billion Swedish crowns um, that will be invested in this region. But the problem is that we have no uh, infrastructure or no full service at all in any of the smaller villages that where people might uh, be living. So therefore, the 10 municipalities have, have decided to uh, go about this with, by co-planning uh, uh, regional lower airspace under the leadership of, of IBG. So, and uh, the outcome we are, uh, we are foreseeing is a develop uh, where we uh, integrate airspace design and infrastructure, uh, infrastructure planning. And uh, hopefully that would be a starting point for all municipalities in Sweden. Uh, to to use this um, method because uh, wherever a drone flies it will fly, fly over the, the the land of a, uh, a municipality <clears throat> so what needs to be analyzed and planned I guess you have been covering covered, uh, covering this uh, throughout the day, but um, of course we have vertiports, takeoff and landing sites that needs to be uh, analyzed where to where to to put them. We need uh, transport nodes, distribution and transshipment points, charging station, electricity and fuel supply. 
And there are a lot of uh, drone manufacturers that are actually going for electric fuels uh, from, from the beginning and skipping that battery uh, stage. We also need to uh, see that we have uh, coverage uh, from the telecommunication networks and so we can use the, the, that digital infrastructure. And we also need air corridor and airspace design. And um, according to Swedish uh, law, there is a, um, uh, we need to, uh, the municipalities need to document all the planning in an overview plan. And we think that also in the future, the lower airspace will be the new part of the overview plan for the, for the, for the, the, the planning people. <clears throat> As we see it at IBG, for a complete infrastructure, regional development is key. So if we don't look at the regional needs, what needs to be developed uh, in order to uh, provide full service to the inhabitants in that region, there will be no complete infrastructure because we need that regional development um, as a base for before we go into analysis and planning and uh, implementing the infrastructure. So, um, what time is it? It's uh, almost um, half. It's 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 ten thirty Swedish time here now. So, uh, Hemant, do I have the time for showing that? It's a it's a three to four minute uh, video. Okay, I need to stop share before uh, I start the video. So I will stop sharing now. Uh, see where I can find that. Uh, there we go. So, and so. Can you see my screen again? Okay. Then I will run the video. Can, As the international can you hear the sound? Electrical vertical takeoff and landings, or drones if you prefer, is expanding. Services such as air taxi or first and last mile delivery is emerging. Meanwhile, the infrastructure for the landing and takeoff platforms are almost non-existent in our cities and rural areas. The airspace above us is also not adequately regulated, leaving us unprepared for the future revolution of air travel. Let me now show you how a simple cookie crumble can be the start and end of a journey. We at Cookie Jar present the next major leap forward in solving the infrastructure problem and the lower airspace dilemma. We build Verity port platforms for drones to vertically take off and land in key locations, much like bus stops in urban or rural areas. We do this through a modular construction that we refer to as cookie crumbles. By dynamically adapting the final approach and takeoff area to the incoming and departing traffic, we can optimize throughput whilst maintaining safety. Cookie layer is our functional layer solution that provides extra features such as heating, lighting, dynamic landing zones, positioning, guidance, or other desired services. Our platforms are modular, reusable, and designed for suburb to suburb travel rather than city center to city center or airport to airport. 
by adding crumbles to our platform, we can expand the start and landing areas when so required. However, this may not be needed at stage one and can therefore easily be added later. Let's jump in and visit some friends across town. To provide full service for our customers in this new and unexplored space, we have exclusive partnerships with our sister company, Independent Business Group, and their advanced air mobility services. IBG have expanded their airspace know-how from the conventional air traffic management industry to meet the needs of advanced air mobility in order to enable drone taxi and cargo operators. Once the airspace design has been built, unmanned traffic management or use space services are required to enable monitoring of all the drone operations. UTM is how airspace will be managed and monitored, enabling multiple safe drone operations to be conducted beyond visual line of sight in the lower airspace. For use space services, we partner with international European air navigation market leaders offering unmanned aircraft system traffic management, UTM. Cookie Jar, together with IBG and our UTM partners, jointly offer turnkey infrastructure solutions to cities, municipalities, and regions around the world. The future of air travel is already here, and we need to meet this rapidly growing demand. Much like the story of Hansel and Gretel, the journey starts with a trail of cookie crumbles. Well, that was a very European-oriented uh, video, I, I realized. <laughs> so, well, uh, that's, um, that's a wrap, Amant. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for, um, for that wonderful session. It was a pleasure hosting you. And uh, rightly, I mean, similar to how the construction of roads and highways are important before the automobiles can ply, uh, it's really important that we start building these, uh, this crucial bit of infrastructure before the deployment of these uh, drones and aircrafts. And yes. uh, mm. the development of this uh, infrastructure has to start now, uh, really, it, uh, because the, the uh, yeah. So um, Hans, thank you very much again for joining the session. It was really eye-opening, especially with the presentation and the Okijar video about what's happening in Sweden and uh, how IVG is playing a critical role uh, in not just the analysis and planning, but also maturing the uh, and, and prototyping some of the VertiPort infrastructure um, that you are doing there and uh, how we will work together in future and leverage the Swedish uh, success and probably create a customized solution for a country like India. It would be a pleasure. Uh, yeah. it's, it, uh, it's, um, but it, it seems to be a similar problem uh, all over the world uh, where we talk about um, airspace design and we talk about drones flying in restricted areas and stuff, but uh, there's not a lot of people talking about the the development of the actual infrastructure that is needed to make this happen. So, okay. Well, so uh, thank you once again, uh, Hans, and we will continue our um, uh, we will continue to host you again uh, in very near future, and hopefully we will uh, materialize some of the um, close collaboration that we are looking forward to with IBG and uh, hope it happens very soon thank you very much likewise thank you very much bye 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 okay uh, so our next uh, and the final speaker for this wonderful seminar today is uh, professor abhishek uh, from the department of aerospace engineering at uh, iit kanpur and uh, his areas of interest are in the development of rotary wing uh, aeromechanics uh, the vertical takeoff and landing systems, and also the autonomous rotary wing UAVs. Uh, and he will take us through the understanding of the design and uh, manufacturing challenges and opportunities uh, with regards to the advanced air mobility systems. 
So welcome, Professor Abhishek. Uh, please take the forum and uh, share your uh, thoughts and insights. Thank you. Thank you, Hemant, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Art Park for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. Although this topic, I mean, is so vast that I mean, I would actually would have uh, enjoyed giving a full semester long course uh, to cover the various aspects of this uh, particular problem. But nevertheless, I'll try to summarize my uh, very rudimentary understanding of this whole problem uh, in next uh, 20 odd minutes. Okay. So design and manufacturing of an air ambulance. So on one side, you see actually an existing air ambulance, which is quite popular uh, abroad, okay, especially in America and Europe and so on. And on the other side, I mean, you see another picture of a, a futuristic EV tall aerial vehicle flying alongside a helicopter. So it's like, I mean, what uh, future holds for us. So this is a, 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 a sort of a summary of my uh, area of expertise. I work on a lot of uh, aerial vehicles, mostly smaller vehicles, because that's what we can handle easily in academic environments. Uh, but then, I mean, uh, we work on all kinds of aerial vehicles and we have done designs of uh, uh, air ambulance, as I will uh, show soon. Uh, or rather uh, uh, search and rescue uh, helicopter uh, in the past. So I'll start with background introduction, uh, uh, where I mean the critical point is to understand the customer requirement because without that we cannot actually uh, go into the design aspect of the problem. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon some of the challenges and possibilities and uh, out outline the design process for eVTOL systems. And uh, I'll just have a few slides to sort of uh, give an overview of the manufacturing process uh, uh, but I mean, like I said, I mean, each of these aspects are very vast in, in, in themselves. So let's start first with the nomenclature. This I just copied from Wikipedia, uh, uh, where uh, Air Ambulance is a medically staffed and equipped uh, platform which provides medical care in flight. Uh, so this, and there could be another uh, platform also, which could be a non-medically equipped and staffed aircraft, which is simply used to transport patients without care in flight. So there are two sorts of I mean, air ambulance uh, that could be out there. One is staff having onboard medical care available. Other could be simply something which is used to airlift up uh, an injured person or somebody and transport it to another place. So that based on these two possibilities for uh, aerial vehicle, uh, NATO has actually come up with terms like uh, medevac and uh, casevac. So one is casualty evacuation, other is medical evacuation. And uh, it, is, it was quite surprising for me to find out that uh, rescue operations uh, were attempted, okay? I mean, medical rescue operations were attempted uh, as far as, I mean, in 1970. So that's almost uh, 100 years ago. And that, that's when, I mean, a fixed wing airplane was used to transport somebody who was actually has injured his leg or something from a uh, war site to some, some place else. But then it actually saw this, uh, the whole concept of air ambulance came into uh, being and it started to come up as a strong use case and armies and uh, other uh, defense forces started seeing this actually as a uh, started seeing helicopter actually as what they used to call it angel of mercy when in korean war the mass the mobile hospital army hospitals uh, uh, systems they were operating a lot of these helicopters which we'll so see soon so in korean war and in vietnam war in america they saw huge application of this air ambulances so here is a quick summary of history of air ambulance. So this is the oldest one, which probably was very popular in the Korean war. This is Bell model 47. So it, you can see this is normal. Uh, you could have seen this kind of helicopter in old uh, Hindi movies or uh, Hollywood movies. So on the sides of these, I mean, they actually have put two coffin like uh, uh, structures has been strapped on and through this, they could actually carry uh, injured passenger in a supine position on this. The Bell Huey UH-1, a very popular helicopter. Uh, this saw tremendous application as a medevac helicopter uh, in uh, Vietnam War. And uh, that's when the term uh, Angel of uh, Mercy was coined as a term to refer to this particular helicopter. And then I have put some pictures of uh, existing air ambulances. So you, in this, you can see NOTA type of helicopters. And uh, uh, this is Augusta Westland helicopter. This is this is, sorry, this is NOTA. This is actually a Fenestron kind of helicopter. So these, uh, these helicopters are quite uh, sort of set, set, uh, they set up the benchmark for existing air ambulance systems. So you can see clearly that the, the air ambulance uh, scenario is dominated by helicopters. Of course, airplanes are also used for transporting of uh, passengers over long ranges, but we cannot probably term them as ambulances primarily because normally, I mean, in my head, I mean, I think ambulance is something which reaches the doorstep of a patient and is able to 
give it care immediately while it can be transported to a, a more uh, facilitated hospital in the process. So this is what I mean has been all along. And what I was mentioning earlier that I mean I actually had a chance to work on a similar, not really a, a entirely ambulance kind of platform, but a, a high altitude uh, rescue helicopter was to be designed in uh, the vertical flight society design competition. We happened to win this competition in 2004. And in this objective was to carry out rescue operations from 16,000 feet. So you have people who are injured at uh, during a mountaineering accident or they are struck somewhere because of an avalanche has come or something. And you have to go and rescue such people. So you have to design a helicopter which could uh, hover at such high altitudes and be able to rescue people from there. So that's what I mean, gave me some perspective of the whole problem. And uh, recently there was a similar competition, uh, again organized by a Vertical Flight Society in America, where they gave the challenge of rescuing people from top of Mount Everest with a payload of almost 600 kilograms. So that is like, right now, very few helicopters have capability of actually flying as high as uh, that kind of altitude. So this is slightly in a different sense, but still both these helicopters actually had to be equipped with typical uh, medical equipment, which is uh, there in a standard air ambulance system. So, so that gave me some idea about this. And uh, this is also, so this was again a design which was done by Maryland team, my alma mater, uh, where one, some of my students were also part of the team. So now what are the requirements for an air ambulance? Let's quickly look at that. So of course, uh, one of the essential parts, I mean, I actually have been attending the, the various talks which were very informative for me because as such, I mean, it's not really my background. I mean, uh, this kind of uh, ambulance related things. So I, I was looking at other people's talks and it gave me really good information. So clearly, I mean, a medical air ambulance uh, would definitely require some of these equipments, uh, if not all of them, like cardiac monitors, defibrillators, pacemaker, oxygen cylinders, life support kits, diagnostic and trauma related supplies, some of those things. Then if the, the patient actually has to be winched up or hoisted, because if somebody is actually injured at a site where a helicopter cannot land, in such scenarios, you would require some rescue equipment like uh, rescue litter, uh, rescue basket, and some winch or hoist kind of system to lift up the, 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 the person. So the, the reason I'm listing out these items is because these things are actually going to be essential in the futuristic air ambulance based on electric vertical takeoff and landing systems that we are going to talk about in a moment. And if in case, I mean, the same ambulance may have to also play the role of uh, searching for the survivor, because you may have gotten a distress call from somebody and you are trying to find where they are, then I mean, we may require some additional equipment like flare, search lights, radar systems to be fitted into our uh, aerial vehicle. And last but not least, the seating space for the paramedic or doctor who is going to be accompanying the patient as he is transferred to the, the main healthcare facility. So, so this actually is to give you a perspective of what kind of payload is required because the entire design process is dependent on and the, and the outcome of the design process is actually dependent on the the payload that we are going to carry. So these are the, some of the payloads which would be absolutely essential for an air ambulance. Now the question is why is there a need for a new design or why are we talking about this electrical or drone based systems and so on? Uh, while we already have a perfectly, I would say proven system in the form of a helicopter. And we saw that, I mean, the, the entire air ambulance market is actually dominated by helicopters of different size and scales. Uh, but there, then, I mean, uh, somebody today, I mean, uh, uh, who operates actually such air ambulance service, he, he was kind enough to point out that, I mean, sustaining such a business in India is quite challenging. And uh, helicopters are very, very expensive equipments. And they have, I mean, they are expensive to acquire and also expensive to maintain. And being mechanically complex system, it requires, I mean, it's a, pretty much an, a, a flying airplane. And uh, therefore, it is not that uh, lucrative or affordable in India. So through eVTOL, I mean, it looks like there may be a possibility of coming up with simpler solutions, which will be, which will not have the mechanical complexity and requ won't require so much of maintenance and yet be able to uh, offer us uh, cheaper, affordable solutions. So if you just put a keyword eVTOL in an email search on any search engine, it will throw out thousands of pictures. And I just took a snapshot to give you an idea that I mean, in Silicon Valley, currently right now, I would say there would be 100 to 200 of these eVTOL companies who are trying to come up with one configuration or the other. And all of them come in so many different shapes and sizes, which makes it really challenging for us to understand that, I mean, okay, how do we choose what would be a good platform to go with? Okay. 
and the answer is not very simple i'll try to take you towards that direction but then let us first understand what exactly is ebitol because uh, if there are people from medical community they may not be familiar with this term so ebitol is basically a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft which will be propelled by electric drive and it will be capable of carrying people so this is a common term which is used to refer to these kind of platforms it could be a electric helicopter it could be a futuristic vehicle which uh, can do still vertical takeoff and landing so vertical takeoff and landing is critical part because for a uh, air ambulance this is a absolute necessity in my opinion now this has been made possible now because uh, it's not that i mean people did not think about such concepts earlier but it has now become possible primarily because of two drivers one is the dramatic growth of uh, uh, permanent magnet motors uh, so we call them brushless dc motors and they are of different kinds so these motors have now i mean come to the specific power where you can say kilowatt per kilogram of the motor this has reached to a point where it is not possible to design this aerial vehicles which can do this and the second is of course the the significant development of uh, energy capacity of the batteries so if you look at the energy density of batteries the lithium ion batteries actually have now set the benchmark where i mean we can expect some very high performance which enables us to achieve reasonably meaningful ranges uh, because the ambulances would have to uh, carry the passenger over uh, meaningful ranges and not just i mean very short uh, distances which may be okay for maybe urban air mobility or something so the motivation for this whole ebitol thing actually comes from the promise of new urban air mobility and it it is kind of imperative for us to adapt some of the solutions for air ambulance application because when helicopters were developed they were developed for army or for air force but then everybody saw that there is a huge role of uh, saving lives of people that can be done using helicopters so this e vitol systems are expected to be easy to fly they are supposed to be safe clean quiet and would require low maintenance and uh, the understanding and knowledge of uh, vertical takeoff and landing concepts is now adequate which allows us to so there are some technical terms i have used like uh, now coming from a helicopter where is, there is a mechanically complex system we are eliminating all those mechanically complex uh, systems from that and we can now change the speed of the motor because we have uh, brushless uh, dc motors uh, it will allow also us uh, to have distributed propulsion and we may be able to reduce gear boxes which weigh a lot and uh, then the most critical aspect is that because of our experience with drone technology now we have adequate autonomy available which will make these uh, drones or uh, evitol systems easy to fly operate and you would not have to actually go and have a, a a pilot's license to or commercial pilot license to operate these platforms so how did this uh, the entire thing uh, started uh, well in the early uh, last decade they first started by trying to convert existing helicopters or make some small helicopters which could be electrically powered okay. and that's what i mean these examples are but here i mean still the transmission was required because uh, there was a single rotor which actually has very very high torque requirement and therefore you have to have the mechanical transmission and all other complexities were there uh, this could do very uh, short range flights like 30 nautic nautical mile for r44 uh, at around 18 knots in 2018 this was already achieved so this is a helicopter which is now electrically powered helicopter but still it is a helicopter still piloted by a, a person and it doesn't have the autonomy required Uh, for uh, the the kind of uh, uh, mission that we have on our mind there are other developments i mean this is uh, some very famous video from youtube i mean i remember seeing this actually in around 2011 12 when uh, the people from this evolo tried to create this uh, a flying vehicle where i mean a person could sit on a chair and uh, it's uh, like a uh, a drone which is lifting a person and then finally it ended up becoming into this volocopter and there are many other evitol concepts which are coming up so let's uh, look at them in more detail uh, but before we go into that we have to just take a quick look at there are so many different concepts uh, which are out there and we have to understand that i mean uh, what are the pros and cons and how do we go about selecting them so there are helicopter kind of vehicles like this and this and this third one multi rotor also comes in a helicopter category vehicle this is a different kind of helicopter cyclical rotor which is also now posing as a nice option for making evitol vehicles in russia people are actually working on this concept and then there are other concepts which are actually a mix between an airplane and a helicopter kind of device so which has also wings and also rotors for vertical lift so with these vehicles the objective is to sort of mitigate the shortcoming of uh, airplane kind of vehicle or fixed wing uh, and also that of the rotary wing so idea is that Uh, my fixed wing vehicle requires a runway so i cannot uh, have that 
if I want to go and rescue somebody from a remote area. Uh, so I, I, I need helicopter kind of vertical takeoff and landing capability, but then my helicopter would not have adequate range. So if I can also use fixed wing, I may be able to achieve somewhat higher range than I mean what my normal helicopter would do. So the idea is to combine best from both these worlds and build systems. And there are many of these systems out there uh, of different configurations. Several of these which are sitting on their tail are called tail sitters, like all three of them. Uh, this is a tilting kind of device. This is also a tilting kind of device. This is a separate lift and uh, propulsion device where you, your thrust comes from a separate motor and, uh, and lifting comes from separate motors. So now to and even more, there are more tail sitters and uh, tilt wings and tilt rotors. There's a compound helicopter which is being developed by Airbus uh, and so on. So now all those things, whatever you saw, can be broadly classified in these three categories. So all these VTOL systems. So there's classical rotary wing kind of system. So this could be helicopter type or multi-rotor type like what you see in the Volocopter. Then we have lift and thrust type systems such as uh, this is um, Google's or sorry, the Kitty Hawk's Cora. And then there are compound helicopters like this is X2 being developed by Sikorsky, sorry. Uh, uh, this is S97 Raider being developed by Sikorsky helicopters. Then there are tilting rotor concepts uh, such as uh, Joby Aviation's design and tilting wing concept. This is Wahana by Airbus and tilting body. So the, you saw tail sitter. So this tail sitter kind of thing, I mean, one would think uh, because in tail sitter, what happens? The entire body actually tilts by certain angle. So it may look like, I mean, this may not be suitable because I mean, if you see the passenger may be standing initially and then he will be completely in horizontal position when the vehicle starts flying. But then people have actually come up with uh, careful innovations to make tilt body systems like this is black flies opener. Now the, the challenge is that, I mean, uh, all these platforms has their positives and negatives. And uh, finally, we want to go in a direction where we should be able to achieve the, the mission requirements and the safety. So we'll, we'll come to the design driver. So, so I'll quickly show you some of the videos of these uh, platforms uh, to give you an idea how they take off and land. So this is uh, this is like a more like a common multi-rotor kind of system. The second video is that of Lilium Jet. The third video is uh, of Wahana, which is a tilt wing design. And the fourth vehicle is that of Cora. So Cora has this separate propulsion and lift system. The e-hang design that is the first video is actually like a normal multi-rotor. But the key thing is that, I mean, if you want to achieve the adequate performance, if you are really looking at economical, I mean, the economy of operation, a hybrid vehicle would be the way forward. These multi-rotor based vehicles, I mean, they may be very simple to make and uh, low hanging fruit, but in the longer run, they are going to be obsolete in the sense that everybody else will be able to achieve significantly superior performance compared to people who are going to completely rely on multi-rotor as a solution like Volocopter or E-Hanks design or any other multi-copter based design. Because with those systems, I mean, achieving meaningful range and payload capacity would be out of question. All right, so these videos, I mean, I, I hope you could, now, I mean, I'll show you the final video, this fifth one, which is that of uh, this, uh, Opener, it's a black fly, which actually is a very unique platform, which actually tilts the body by almost 45 degrees. And uh, it's a very simple design, no turning system, no, uh, and all those things. So, right, so the objective is to get high efficiency and uh, superior performance. So, the, what are the key design drivers in an air ambulance system? The efficiency in hover is, of course, very important. Gust tolerance, so that, I mean, you should be able to handle windy conditions even when you are rescuing. Uh, the air that is coming from the rotor wash should be not very high. So there are some of the parameters which I mean were considered in the previous designs of uh, such uh, air ambulance systems. But beyond these items, another important considerations could be noise, your performance in forward speed, how fast you can go and how is your efficiency. And the most important is the safety. So safety, I mean, has been mentioned somewhat in this also actually, in terms of the safety of the, the ground crew, etc. cetera. Uh, but I mean, this, are the, some of the items, but then depending on the exact uh, requirements, I mean, sometimes, I mean, uh, you may have to give a particular uh, design driver higher priority or lower priority, depending on exactly what mission are you designing it for. So this is the categorization for uh, drones as per DGCA, but I don't think that, I mean, DGCA has yet actually come up with the, the possibility of manned drones. 
uh, even though they talk about i mean drones going uh, larger than 150 kilograms and going to 500 or 600 kilograms which may allow possibility of development of manned drones but then the certification would be a completely different ball game which was very nicely covered in the previous talk so now the how do we go about designing an e bottle air ambulance well the payload is going to be the key driver and uh, that actually would uh, uh, dictate how we design uh, go about the whole design process and what will be the final configuration is it going to be for uh, one medic and one uh, uh, patient or is it going to be for two medic two patients so depending on that and what all equipment i want to keep on board based on that i will have to decide my payload my range would be again that i mean is it going to operate over a range of say 100 kilometers 150 kilometers or some such uh, distance so that range and payload so endurance may not be very important here at all and uh, it will be just an outcome of i mean my design choices so this will enable us to go about doing the aerodynamic and structural optimization for the the whole design so apart from the design here the autonomy aspect will be very very vital because what happens when i actually go in a helicopter i will have a pilot and a co-pilot so now that actually adds significant weight so you will be carrying another at least another 150 kilograms and you have sitting space your chair and all those things for them but now in our e vital system there need not be a pilot okay. the entire system could be autonomous and the autonomy would play a, a major major role in the whole uh, air ambulance development uh, aspect that brings us to also the manufacturing considerations so i'll skip some of these parts these are more technical details uh, of course the the e vital system which we are envisioning is actually a system of systems uh, thing so you have structural systems you have to look at the design in in a separate sense also remember that these e vital systems are more closer to being an helicopter than an airplane and therefore having background of vertical flight systems is very very important in design process so i'll skip this part also i'll directly jump to the manufacturing aspects which are just two more slides so then i mean metal based manufacturing so manufacturing is fairly straightforward i would not say actually that there is a new challenge in the manufacturing design may be quite challenging because vital systems have not been designed in the past and people who may think that it is as simple as designing an airplane then they are going to be in for a major surprise there so the manufacturing of metal plastic fiber reinforced composites and advanced materials could be used for manufacturing and all these things are actually already established processes for various industry i just show you some examples so here is a video of a, a 3d printer actually printing the airframe of a multi rotor in in a, in a span of time so a lot of these techniques could be used to quickly prototype things and understand i mean how things are and uh, of course large scale production can be also ensued uh, composite based manufacturing is also fairly standard there is nothing new about that i mean uh, there are autoclave based processes and out of autoclave based processes uh, and all those things could be used to design uh, so i have given an example of a uav how the entire airframe could be designed by process of molding and uh, vacuum bagging or by making molds here and then using it to manufacture the whole uh, vehicle okay so that is all from my side so thank you very much i mean yeah i mean i try to stick to time as much as possible and i'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any uh well thank you very much uh, professor abhishek uh, this was indeed uh, the missing piece of the whole puzzle for today's seminar um, and the engineering and technological challenges have always uh, kind of evaded india when it comes to the development of commercial aircrafts um, and as you rightly mentioned uh in your talk hybrid design is the way forward and i think uh, just a single design configuration may be insufficient for the different mission profiles that we uh, kind of envisage for this kind of an air ambulance concept of operations <laughs> so um yeah i am sure uh, the participants have got a lot of useful insights from your session and uh, i have got some uh, maybe couple of questions from the audience so if that is okay maybe uh, we can have these uh, couple of questions from your side um so one question is uh, statistically it uh, rains every second uh, every second day uh, in a place like sikkim uh, how do we overcome the challenges of uh, such rainy and poor wind, uh, weather conditions to operate uh, these yeah, so i mean uh, see uh, none of these vehicles are going to get certified okay, uh, for operation unless and until they meet these very basic weather requirements and uh, the previous presenter i mean uh, uh, your friend actually he talked very nicely about uh, how the the lighting protection snowy i mean protection in snowy environment all those things have, have to be taken care of so of course these vehicles are going to be meant for all weather operation but yes there would be a limit on 
the wind conditions. I mean, no aerial vehicle out there can actually fly in every possible wind condition. So, but then, I mean, once the vehicle is designed, I mean, you will know exactly what kind of wind disturbances it can handle, what kind of gust speeds it can handle. And some of the certification requirements are already there that, I mean, it should be able to handle wind gust of around like what 66 feet per second or some such thing was already there. Okay. So it will be certified and once it is certified, it will be able to operate from that. So, so the, the rain, no rain, I mean, the, the evac operation can definitely be conducted. Right. Um, probably one question that comes to my mind, uh, see, when we are thinking about deploying these kinds of aircrafts in large numbers, uh, we obviously have to think about um, not just prototyping, but having a matured manufacturing industry to be able to take up this challenge. So when we are designing as partners with the academia and also the startups uh, developing some of the missing pieces, the man, how, uh, based on your perspective and based on your experience, how matured is the Indian manufacturing industry to no, I mean, see, we, uh, take we, on such a challenge? No, I mean, it's, I don't think, I mean, that is an issue at all. Okay? I mean, the manufacturing is definitely not a challenge. I mean, the challenge could be electronics. Okay? The challenge could be, I mean, motors, okay? uh, because those things we are still importing and relying from outside. But manufacturing, if you see, I mean, Boeing Chinook's uh, entire airframe, I mean, significant portion of airframe gets made in Bangalore, actually. Uh, and uh, even now, I mean, there are a lot of manufacturers who are doing manufacturing for Airbus, Boeing, or whosoever actually uh, across the globe. So, and we are making our own LCA, which is an entire composite aircraft. So, I don't see manufacturing being a bottleneck. Yes, I mean, right amount of investments have to be made and right setups have to be created to carry that out. But before that, I mean, you have to first make the whole platform. In India, we have never made a VTOL vehicle. Okay. Helicopter, yes, I mean, we, HAL we has been doing a fantastic job, I mean, at making helicopters. But if you see, uh, we are still only beginning to warm up to this problem uh, that we have to make some uh, e-vital systems. I mean, how many people are actually trained and uh, qualified to work on such systems in the country? I mean, only a handful of people actually. Okay. And uh, it's very, very small number. When I see in America, I mean, there are at least hundreds of PhDs, I mean, in this kind of domain who are working continuously. So. Uh, Wahana project by Airbus, it actually had two of my friends, I mean, who had PhD from same place with same faculty, more or less, I mean, we were working there actually. So these people are very trained, they have worked in this particular domain for such a long period. Uh, and even then, it's a very challenging problem. Okay? When we have so many people working together, also, it is not an easy problem to solve because I often saw in my class uh, uh, a particular diagram which we call E, e uh, sorry, uh, V slash stall wheel of misfortune which talks about in last uh, 50 odd years, 45 designs in eVTOL, I mean, that wheel has to be upgraded, of course. So many designs have been tried and out of those 50 odd designs, only two designs are under production. So it tells you that the nature of problem uh, uh, that we are dealing with. So vertical takeoff and landing vehicles are not very straightforward to make. Helicopters are very well known, airplanes are very well known, but when you try to mix the two things together, it becomes somewhat more complicated, especially at larger scale. Smaller scale is fine. I mean, all these people who are flying this toy, I mean, four or five kilo drones, I mean, those are toys. I mean, everything works at that level. You don't have to worry about the, the aerospace part of that, I mean, so much. But when you go to full scale, things are not that easy. Okay. Professor Abhishek uh, uh, Hello, yes, Professor yeah. yeah, in continuation with what you're saying, you have your popular model, which uh, I thought you will show that. You didn't show that you were uh, tilt uh, uh, wing. Uh, right, right, right. Right. Is that not scalable or what is your take? No, it is scalable. All these are scalable. But the, when you go to scalability, okay, what happens? I mean, right now, when I make a small UAV, I mean, I can do the autopilot development for that game tuning and everything. The structural design, everything can be done very easily. I mean, without having to worry too much about. See, what happens in all these hybrid uh, uh, VTOL vehicles, the transition is the most challenging aspect. When you switch between the helicopter from the helicopter mode to the airplane mode and vice versa, that is where a lot of interesting aerodynamics happens. At smaller scale, this aerodynamic is actually somewhat uh, forgiving, I would say. But when you go to larger scale, it is no longer that forgiving and autopilot development becomes a major challenge because now things are flexible. It's no longer as rigid as in the smaller scale. And your behavior is so nonlinear that, I mean, simple PID kind of controller may not easily work. So you have to... So the modeling of dynamics in an accurate manner would be very, very important. 
And uh, I've actually, I've seen some examples where people who have already been flying these small uh, quad plane drones, when they went to higher scales, bigger scales, they started seeing their drones falling from the sky one after the other. Every time they were doing transition, there would be something happening and they were completely unaware what was going on. True, true. So, so there are some phenomena which actually is quite dramatic, which unless until you come from helicopter community, which I mean, you are quite familiar with, you will understand that, uh, yeah, that yeah. is not very easy to understand, especially people from who are coming from the completely fiction world. True. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Professor Abhishek. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think uh, uh, I think we'll have to stop uh, uh, for the moment because uh, uh, we are already exceeding the time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abhishek, for sharing the insights on the design and manufacturing aspects of EVTOLS. Um, hopefully, uh, we will soon come to you uh, again um, because Art Park is looking forward to um, uh, so working together with IIT Kanpur and uh, especially with you. Uh, given your expertise on uh, uh, the helicopter design and EVTOLs. So we will uh, uh, shortly, I mean, uh, very soon in near future have similar uh, such seminars and probably actionize uh, the development of an air ambulance in the months coming forward. No, it was a, this was actually a really great initiative and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Onkar to inviting me for this. Uh, so it was really a great learning experience for me by looking at all the talks and panel discussions and so on. So thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abhishek. So uh, now we have come to an end of this uh, wonderful seminar. And uh, now I would like to hand over uh, the forum to Mr. Umakan Soni, uh, who is uh, the CEO of Art Park uh, for a vote of thanks. Uh, please welcome Mr. Umakant. Uh, thanks, Himant uh, and Professor Omkar for organizing this. I think this is fantastic. I would like to actually thank all the uh, you know, honorable speakers who actually came at this occasion and really enlightened us with the <clears throat> deep knowledge of this area. Uh, this is a you know, fantastic area. It's a new beginning. And probably India is the, the right early adopted market uh, you know, for this kind of innovation. Uh, because if you look at it, we actually account for the highest number of road accidents globally, right? With more than one and a half lakh people you know, killed and, you know, close to four and a half lakh, uh, you know, people uh, crippled, which is half a million, right? Uh, we, we have close to half a million road accidents, right? And uh, not just the road accidents, which happen all around the country, but also we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, challenges which are like, you know, uh, stroke patients and heart patients, which probably require emergency care. And uh, given that we have six lakh, uh, you know, 50,000 plus villages, 40% uh, of them don't have all weather connectivity. It's a big problem. Uh, you know, today, all of those people actually, you know, pr practically give up uh, on a human life that could have been saved. And uh, I feel this initiative, uh, you know, will, you know, first of all, will actually work to alleviate this um, massive, uh, you know, problem because, uh, you know, today, uh, this is also one of the big reasons why people are migrating toward big cities. And, uh, you know, we know and we've seen uh, that, you know, uh, urban migration is not a very sustainable phenomena. Uh, if we actually end up with uh, 40 cities the size of Delhi, uh, which we might, if we, you know, if we keep growing this way uh, by 2030, uh, this is not uh, going to be actually uh, a very useful solution. So we need to think uh, in a different way and think tangentially. We need to think creatively. And that is where, uh, you know, Art Park or AI and Robotics Technology Park that has been promoted by an industry of science and supported by AI Foundry comes in. Uh, we want to encourage, uh, you know, this kind of innovation to come to life. And we feel that uh, while, you know, we might be finding the first use case in emergency healthcare, uh, it could actually uh, also have, uh, you know, usages in other areas as well, where we're talking about logistics, uh, because, uh, you know, the last mile logistics, which are the trickiest part in India, which could actually open up uh, new employment opportunities and economy in the rural areas, which are primarily agrarian at this moment, and uh, they would actually undergo transition. So today, if uh, a person has to aspire to actually have a better life, then he has to migrate to cities. 
and uh, with this kind of uh, you know uh, physical connectivity uh, which could be there for emergency services and maybe later on for other things as well they don't have to so we might be actually pioneering or starting to think about a new model uh, which could be driven more by smart clusters rather than by smart cities and i think uh, this is a this is a deep thought that i would leave you uh, with uh, saying that uh, it's not just uh you know uh, just saving uh, human life which is actually a big goal but also potentially transforming the economic and uh, social uh, perspective of uh, the growing india uh, which actually is at stake here so I would urge all of the researchers uh, you know companies uh, startups innovators uh, you know people who could use uh, this kind of solution out there and we are not just looking at uh, you know people to join who are just in india but even globally as well uh, you know to come and join us uh, we would be actually also seeking uh, you know a letter of interest from people who want to use this kind of solution so if you are a company or you are connected with a company who could actually potentially have a use for this kind of solution or if you know somebody who probably would be uh, desiring such a solution Uh, please connect us we would be very happy to work with them art park is designed to bring academia industry and governments together to collaborate for a better future uh, so all are welcome thank you well uh, thank you for uh, for the thought uh, umakant uh, that was uh, and thank you for uh, introducing art park uh, in the end um just before we close the session i would like to just announce that um, the entire seminar was recorded and uh, very soon i think by tomorrow uh, the recording will be available to all the registered participants and the speakers um and along with the uh, seminar recording we will also be sharing a feedback form for the seminar so we would very keenly urge you all uh, those who are still there in the seminar to please provide your feedback this will help us improve in uh, conducting uh, further uh, further uh, seminars uh, uh, i think we will take a decision to do this kind of a seminar or at least a shorter version of it uh, quite frequently i think uh, once in uh, once in two weeks or at least uh, once in a month uh, and we will share be sharing our progress uh, going forward so please provide your uh, valuable feedback to us thank you very much and uh, with this uh, i would like to uh, thank you all for attending this uh, this seminar um, yeah we can we can close it now thank you all very much thank you Do you know that 42000 deaths occur in India in a day because the necessary health service couldn't reach every doorstep within 60 minutes? This is the golden hour. Could an autonomous air ambulance reach victims faster and help save them when every second counts? Art Park proposes the Aero 108. an unmanned flying ambulance that could save millions of lives it can fly two patients accompanied by a humanoid if required it is equipped with state of the art instruments and it can carry out autonomous operations it also has an interactive technology that connects patients and medical professionals even when separated by vast distances The Aero 108s are monitored by control center hubs located in various parts of the country. These hubs route the nearest stationed Aero 108 to the location of the emergency. IoT sensors in smart vehicles and smart infrastructure can also signal the Aero 108 in case of an accident. Imagine a situation where a train derails in an isolated area. Any of the survivors can immediately call the helpline number and a fleet of Aero 108 will be there for the rescue. The Aero 108 
with its cutting-edge sensors, analyzes the layout of the area and lands safely. The humanoid paramedics act as mobile medical scanners for the medical experts in the trauma center. Smart stretchers also double up as active sensors to analyze the patient's condition. The humanoid paramedic can deliver emergency first aid under constant supervision by the doctor in the trauma center. With the next generation of medical automation tools, the Aero 108 can also be used as a flying ICU unit. The Aero 108 can also help the disaster management team perform a rescue operation by evacuating the injured, can reach rural and remote areas quicker than any other form of assistance, can be a great aid during a natural crisis. Just like other futuristic technologies, the Aero 108 comes with its own challenges. Aero 108 vehicle design and engineering to safely evacuate a patient under harsh environmental conditions is a major challenge. Robotics and automation technologies to reach the patient, stabilize them and load them onto the vehicle is a daunting challenge. Very advanced AI and robotics technologies will need to be developed to enable a safe and robust solution that will work well under harsh terrain and difficult conditions. We certainly need a giant leap in technology before our dream of Aero 108 can be fully realized. Nevertheless, this could be the next step to the future. In 10 years, if the Aero 108 is developed, we will be able to save millions of people, not only in India, but around the world. Thank you. See you in the future.